lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. I'm so delighted to have today's guest on the show. I'm speaking with Karen Rexroad. Karen is such a source of wisdom and insight for gardeners. She's a Northern Virginia gardener, a popular garden speaker, and she's my favorite kind of subject matter expert when it comes to plants because Karen has been an owner-operator. Karen built Windy Hill Plant Farm in Loudoun County from the ground up, and for 25 years, she specialized in perennials and unusual annuals. Today, Karen is giving us an encore of her presentation on the plant explorers. Karen covers 18 different plant explorers, or plant hunters as they're often called, focusing mainly on the 18th through the 20th century explorers. Driven, brave, and curious, plant hunters sacrificed plenty in their quest for new species and rare specimens. Karen does a marvelous job of bringing these fascinating explorers to life, sharing their successes, their connections, and their humanity. Karen's research into plant explorers reminds us all about the often overlooked yet fascinating history of plant exploration. I know I have a renewed appreciation for so many plants after listening to Karen's keynote at the Garden Blockers Fling, and I'm hoping you'll discover that same excitement. I'm certain that you will have a new feeling of gratitude for the sacrifice and the outrageous lengths that were taken to bring the plants we know today out of the wild, out of obscurity, and into our gardens and our hearts. Prominent horticulturist, garden speaker, and creative force, Karen Rexroad, and her presentation, Plant Explorers, that's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. But first, I want to say thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week. If you're brand new, welcome. If you've listened before and you're back for more, thank you for being here. And you know, I always say that I hope you're listening to a ton of gardening podcasts, not just this show, because it's such a great way to grow and learn as a gardener. I've started checking out the Joe Gardner podcast. His latest episode, episode 12, featured Doug Tallamy, the author of the book Bringing Nature Home. And when I had Peggy Ann Montgomery on the show, that was the book that Peggy Ann was talking about. So that's a great episode. I also listened to the episode before that with Teresa Lowe. She was sharing quick and easy ways to bank the bounty, to bank the harvest. That was on the Joe Gardner podcast. And then also Bree Arthur, the guest we had on back in episode 569. She's the author of The Foodscape Revolution. And she and Joe have worked together for years. And it was so fun to hear her talk about something she's massively passionate about, and that's propagating. So if you're interested in that, you can take a very deep dive into the world of propagating and learn a ton with Brie on Joe's show. So check that out. Another one I wanted to make you aware of is called Botanical Brouhaha. They're featured later on in the Garden News Roundup because they had an article that I really liked. But they've also started a podcast, and I think it's great if you can support new gardening podcasts. A lot of times people talk about the fact that there just are not that many gardening podcasts. Well, I tell you what, if you want more gardening podcasts, you have to listen. We have to support our gardening podcasters. When the numbers aren't there, if the download numbers aren't significant, it's just too darn easy for folks to pod fade, to quit podcasting. And then we all suffer. So make sure you're supporting gardening podcasts. Go ahead, check out a ton of them, 
Keep learning and growing. And if you have a good one, let me know too. I'm driving the kids around all week long, and that's what I do. I listen to gardening podcasts, and I force my kids to listen to them too. So they're becoming little horticulturists, even though they probably don't want to. Well, at least I should say they're becoming somewhat knowledgeable when they're not wearing their headphones and listening to the music that they like or watching The Office. Emma got the little boys watching The Office, old episodes of The Office, and they've started way back at episode one, and they've been binge watching The Office all summer. I think they're on season four right now, but they absolutely love it. And I've been teasing them that someday my grandchildren are going to be named Dwight and Pam and Michael, all the characters from the show, because they're getting such a kick out of watching old episodes of The Office. But in between... When their ears are freed up, they get to hear plenty of gardening podcasts, and I hope that you do too. So anyway, I'm truly, sincerely honored that you're spending some time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast. And of course, I always appreciate it if you can share the show on social media with your gardening friends and family. All right, just a quick word about the mastermind programs that I'm launching this fall. I have a number of three-month mastermind opportunities that are starting up in September. One is for communicators, for bloggers, podcasters, writers, and content creators. And then the other one is for industry professionals, folks in horticulture, landscape designers, greenhouse growers, nursery owner operators looking to grow their business. So if you're interested in pursuing a mastermind opportunity with me at the helm, go ahead, head on over to my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And then just click on the tab, work with me, and you'll see all the information about it. I love masterminds. They're one of the most productive things that I do for myself every single week. And they're a game changer. So whether you're a content creator or an entrepreneur, masterminds are great for their collaboration for the advisement, for the expanded network, the cross-promotion, and the bigger thinking. So if you're interested, I would love to mastermind with you, and I hope to meet you in one of my groups. I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for the show. It's a free private Facebook group that I host for the listeners of the show, and these folks are made up of gardeners of all skill levels and locations. You can find it on Facebook just by typing in the name of our group in the search bar, the Still Growing Podcast Group, and then our group will pop right up. Just request to join. We'll admit you into the group. Now, there are a number of benefits that you enjoy just by joining our group. First, you have access to great garden articles that I curate for you. They'll appear in your Facebook feed. You'll be able to track down the links and check out the articles in more detail. You can also go to the group to get a chance to interact with the guests who have been on the show. And that was my vision for the group. When I first started the group, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if the listeners of the show could interact with the guests of the show online, ask their questions, continue the conversation? That's originally why I created the group. And that's just what happened. So last week's guests, Mary Gray and Annette Gutierrez, the authors of Potted, who were on last week's episode, episode 581, sharing their DIY design tips for creating outdoor containers. They're in the group. So if you have DIY questions or you're creating one of their ideas, one of their great design projects featured in their book, Go ahead, give them a shout out. Ask them your questions. They would love to talk to you about your DIY projects. The other great reason to join the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group, is that it's the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any giveaways. And last week, Annette and Mary generously offered to give away five copies of their book, Potted, to some lucky listeners. So we went into the group and randomly selected the following winners, Alex Long, Tanya Peel, Ann Barklow, Spencer Hoadley, and Carrie Maselli. Congratulations, you guys. There'll be a post in the Facebook group, and you just have to respond 
and private message me with your email address and your physical address so that Annette and Mary can send copies of your book to you right away. So congratulations and thank you, Annette and Mary. Well, if that's not a great reason to join the group, the other reason would be to enjoy all of the free content that I share with you in the listener community. It's something I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. Everything that I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. Just head on over to Facebook In the search bar, type in Still Growing Podcast Group, request to join, and we'll admit you into the group. With that, let's welcome some new members, Anne-Marie Anderson, Philip Busili, Linda Bonnerman, Kathy Jentz, Cindy Eason, Selena Mills, Tammy Austin, Tribly Law, Scott Boyer, Sarah Meyer Dugan, Robert Baxter, Andy Harrington Meyer, Clay Lamb, Maxine Smith, Pepper Make Peace, Shelley Williams, Marie LaRue, Sarah Bunkowski, Jody Callahan, and Marie Flint. Welcome, you guys. Well, this week, there were a number of great posts from listeners sharing beautiful pictures and videos of their gardens. Kathleen Brown Bonafonte shared that her job is managing pediatric cardiology doctors and working with families who have congenital heart disease. So she came up with this idea of creating a fairy garden at her office to celebrate the families and then adding pictures of the kids and patients over time into this wonderful discussion. Display that she created. And as she said at the end of this post, gardens can be everywhere. So if you have the opportunity to add a garden to your workplace, that's a wonderful idea. Jen McGinnis asked the question, what do you do when you decide you've had enough of a plant? She said lamb's ears fall into that category for her. It's taken over her front border, and now that she's considering extending that flower bed forward, she just doesn't know if it's worth saving all of the plants. But like most of us, she feels guilty if she thinks about just tossing out good plants when she doesn't have the room or time to rehome them. So her question is, what do you do with plants in your garden that fall into this category? Patricia Chandler Newport suggested something really great. She said, do you have a neighborhood Facebook page? Patricia puts plants in buckets of water at the end of her driveway, and then she posts them on her community Facebook page. And she said they're usually gone before she can blink. Jennifer Konow said, do you have a community park or butterfly garden in your town? If so, give them a call and ask if they want them. Lots of public gardens might need filler to cut back on weeds or they might want edging items. If you were comfortable with people coming to your home to get them, they'd probably even dig them up for you if you offer them for free. Angie the Freckled Rose said, send some to me. And I said the same thing. I love lamb's ears. And then listener Beth Engel said, pass along plants, compost, brown paper, yard waste sacks. Too much of anything is too much. Gardens should be guilt-free spaces. And I couldn't agree with her more. Angie Latouri, Angie the Freckled Rose said, okay, guys, my first successful watermelon is growing. Does anyone have any advice when it comes to growing watermelon? In the past, my fruits have either started growing too late in the season or have been attacked by critters and bugs. I really want to make sure this baby watermelon keeps on growing. I suggested putting it inside a cage, like a hamster cage or something from a thrift store. I see those things all of the time. And then my friend Jen McGinnis suggested use pantyhose. Insert the melon inside the foot part and it will expand as it grows. You can also tie the other end to something to help provide support. She said she did that last year and it worked great. Then I told Jen, I'm like, this is a great idea. However, I couldn't even remember the last time that I wore pantyhose, so I don't have any in the house. I'm going to have to go out and get some. Not to wear, but for the watermelons. When I was out in the nursery this week, I ran across some beautiful ajuga black scallop, and I shared it in the group with a, a great picture saying, I think this is one of the very darkest foliage plant items that you can put in your garden. It was just gorgeous. The picture that I took made them almost look metallic. Listener Ashley Holloway pointed that out, and I agree. Unfortunately, it was very sunny, 
And no matter how hard I tried with my phone, I just couldn't get that deep, rich color to come through when I was sharing it with the group. But they were just absolutely gorgeous. So a Juga black scallop if you're looking for something very dark in your garden. Oh, and listener Amy Steinhauser said that she has this. She's growing it around the edges of her garden, and she says it's absolutely stunning in early summer when it blooms, and I bet it is. Listener Sue Luftig said, I should be saving to paint the house, but instead I'm buying more perennials. And this is why I love Sue Luftig, because I can relate to anybody who is putting off projects just so that they can buy more plants. That's fantastic. Michelle Dyson Davies said, me too. I just got coral bells at Walmart for 72 cents each. Now I'm deciding where to put them. And Sue said, hey, they're deer resistant. So good investment. And then Patricia Chandler Newport chimed in. It's a sickness. Besides, perennials are way more fun than paint. And boy, can I agree with that. I tell you what, right as I'm recording this, there's someone up in Emma's room painting her room. Susan Ash has come over and she's painting Emma's room. Emma was tired of the little baby wallpaper that I'd put in her room back in 2000. And it just crushed my heart to see that stuff taken down. And I think that's why I hired this job done, because even though I could strip the wallpaper and I could paint, it was just too much of a big milestone for me to go in and do that work. It just was just too much for me to see that come down. I just loved that room. And it's so hard to let those kids grow up, isn't it? It's all good, though. Well, speaking of kids, listener Ann Barklow is making videos, educational videos with one of her crew members for one of the local schools. Their very first video that they put together was a very short but very informative video on collecting milkweed seed. So let me cue this up for you. Imagine you have a milkweed seed pod that you're holding over a small dish. This is how the video starts out. They're holding the milkweed seed pod. There's a close-up on this. And then they begin to talk about how do you access the seed. So if I need to, I'll step in and explain what's happening in the video here since you can't see it. But I think they do a pretty descriptive job. So I think it'll translate pretty well for a podcast. So let's take a listen. We're here in the greenhouse, and Carla is going to show us this milkweed pod from a tuberosa milkweed, and she's going to go ahead and show you how to take the seeds out. Go ahead, Carla. Here we are. We're going to open the seed pod, one that has naturally popped open just a little bit. You don't want to crack open a green one because you have to make sure that the seeds are brown. And you're going to take your fingernail and sort of scrape up at the top to remove this fur. And there's a middle strand right there. You can sort of grab onto it and move your fingers down slowly while holding on to the sides of the pot in order to um, separate the seeds from the fur. Okay, so I'm just going to jump in here quick a second since you can't see the video. But if you can imagine that you're holding a seed pod over a tiny little dish, at the very, very tip, the very top of the seed pod, You can kind of put your fingernail in the natural division. The seed pod starts to split apart, and you can kind of coax that open a little bit. And then it's almost like there's a little strand, is what they called it in the video, but it's a little piece, a little string almost, that as you start to pull back on it, it's like prying open a zipper of this uh, seed pod. And what it does is it begins to take all of the fur that's in that seed pod and it begins to pull that out. Now the seeds are attached to that fur. So what they're doing as they're pulling back is they're holding the pod and holding those seeds within the pod, and then they're just gently removing the fur. It's kind of like detasseling corn is what I think of it as. Anyway, let's continue the video. You can keep on moving down like this, 
And if some of them don't separate, you can get those later. Just keeping it together, go really slow. And just pull that out like that, and then take this big thing and put it somewhere where it won't fly around. It's helpful to have something to catch the seeds um, beneath you so you don't have to pick them up off the table if they fall out. And there you have it. So what she's done at this point is she's just slowly removed all of those little pieces of fur so that when she's collecting seeds, it's not in there, that it's a very clean collection. And so she just finished basically taking all of that out. And now she's about to open the pod up and all of the seeds will just pour right out. Here we go. There you have it, our bunch of seeds right inside the pod. And you can just empty them out. No muss, no fuss. That's exactly right. No muss, no fuss. This was a great video by Anne, and I really liked it. So if you're growing your own milkweed and you want to grow some of your own or share some seeds with neighbors or friends, what you can do is harvest your seed pods, split them open, and clean out the fur and collect your seeds. You can certainly take a look at the video that Anne uploaded in the listener community. So the next time you're in the Still Growing podcast group, just search for Anne, A-N-N, and Anne's video will pop up and then you can just follow along and watch how they harvested the seeds. I thought they did a great job. So good job, Anne. Please tell your coworker she did a great job as well. Now, here's kind of an interesting side note to this story. Another listener commented to Anne about how she got involved in helping with the schools and helping with garden education. And Anne wrote this. I work at the city greenhouses and landscape, and since we don't have time to go to the schools, we're looking into videos and using Skype to bring the greenhouse and garden activities to the schools. We're hoping to Skype to several schools at a time. I love this idea, and what a great solution for schools and garden professionals. Very creative solution, Anne. Listener Spencer Holdley kicked off a little bit of a trend in our group. He wrote, I know I'll be lucky if it ripens by the end of the season, but I have my first ever watermelon. And then he shared the most adorable little picture of his little watermelon that's growing. He said, it's not much to toot about, but I had to toot my own horn a little bit here. And next thing you know, people are sharing pictures of their watermelons, which was fantastic. Sonia Bramledge wrote, mine looks identical to yours, that is, after I found it. So she's got another little tiny watermelon growing in her garden. Julie Mahoney shared pictures of hers. They were considerably bigger. She wrote, I'm excited about mine too, but I'm not sure if there is time, but I'm happy. Listener John Byron Silverio chimed in and said, I wish I could toot my own horn, but my watermelon only has flowers, no fruit yet. And then Spencer wrote that he had checked his watermelon twice a day for almost a week to find the first female flower. And as soon as it opened, he he was out hand pollinating it because he wanted to make sure it would happen. Then listener Carrie Maselli shared a gorgeous picture of some flowers that she cut from her garden. She wrote this, I posted this on my page yesterday and I thought I'd share it here. You can see it's just a couple of clips from my garden, dahlias, salvia, and some coleus from my pots out front. And then here are some great tips that she added. I took a class this spring on arranging flowers from our gardens, and it encouraged me to look at things from the garden differently. I often add stems of my basil I need to pinch back as the greens and upright flowers in place of the salvia. Thai basil with those purple flowers is really pretty, and the smell is amazing. I plan to bring another small vase like this to bring to work so I can enjoy my garden in this way during my workday, particularly important as I work in an interior office and I have no windows. So great tips from Carrie here. If you can't have plants in your workplace because there are no windows and it's just not a great environment for plants, do what Carrie does and bring in fresh cut flowers from your garden. That's a great idea. Listener Sue Luftig shared a great post of her dill with a big, juicy caterpillar on it. It's a swallowtail caterpillar. And she wrote, 
I've always loved butterflies, but look what I almost composted. More dill next year. And if you go on Facebook and you type in dill caterpillar, you will see hundreds of images of swallowtail caterpillars on dill. They love dill. Patricia Chandler Newport took one look at this picture and she typed in two words, Eastern Swallowtail, exclamation mark. And then Kathleen Brown Bonafonte shared pictures of it happening in her garden. She said, me too. Dill has been my most fascinating plant this year. Literally, the aroma wafts into the air every time I get anywhere near and I let mine go to seed and discovered the same thing as you this weekend, loaded with caterpillars. And then Patricia also commented, and this is true as well, that once you grow dill and let it go to seed, you'll never be without it. She has it all over her garden. I love it for that reason as well, too. I let my dill go to seed. I love the fragrance. I love putting it in bouquets. So exactly what Carrie was doing in this previous post here where she was talking about incorporating unusual things into your bouquets. Dill's one of my favorite favorite things to put in a bouquet. But dill's great, I think, if it seeds itself in your garden because it's so light and airy. It doesn't take up a lot of visual space. It's just a very nice little addition to the garden. I let it go whenever it seeds itself somewhere. I think of it in the same way I think of asparagus. So if I have dill that pops up in a bed or asparagus that's in the back of a bed and it's just very gentle very light, kind of flowy, very airy looking plants. Those I love to incorporate into my ornamental gardens. Speaking of butterflies, Robert Woolbright shared just an incredibly gorgeous photo of a butterfly completely splayed out over a plant in his garden. And it was a gorgeous painted lady butterfly in all her glory. I'm telling you, this was a great picture. This is definitely frame worthy. Kathleen Brown Bonafonte shared the harvest from her garden already. She had great pictures. She said, it's my second year of gardening. I promised myself this year I would save seeds, not waste my harvest and learn from my mistakes. Proud of myself that I forced myself to work inside yesterday. Sauce, pickles, basil butter, Oh my goodness, did you hear that? Basil butter, doesn't that sound fantastic? Sautéed peppers and drying herbs. And she had fabulous pictures of everything, including her herbs drying, hanging upside down in the doorway. They looked fantastic. Sue Luftig wrote that her husband had just bought her a dehydrator and her herbs are amazing. Patricia Chandler Newport said she has not bought herbs from a store in years. She loves her dehydrator, and she also dries tomatoes as well. Now, this sparked a little conversation about the temperatures that are used to dehydrate tomatoes. And Patricia said she does herbs at around 125 overnight. With tomatoes, she'd go a little higher, maybe 150. She keeps it running until they're dry to the touch, which takes quite a long time. So she slices them a half inch thick, or if she's got cherry tomatoes, she just cuts them in half. And she said she also stores her dried tomatoes in the freezer or in oil. That's a great suggestion. But I also appreciate what Kathleen wrote when she said two things. First, that she was proud of herself, because I think you should feel proud of yourself when you are able to have a successful harvest. That does not just happen. That requires some work, some planning, and some time and attention. So definitely kudos for that. And then the other thing she said that I keyed in on is where she said, I forced myself to work inside yesterday. And those inside days working with our harvest are super important. This time of year, it's almost more important than being out in the garden. Because if we don't have a chance to harvest, then all of our work has been in vain. So good job, Kathleen. Let's follow in your footsteps and make sure that we schedule some inside days on the calendar to work with the garden harvest. You won't regret it. 
Danny Perkins did a great job sharing videos from his garden again. He's continuing to experiment with the slow motion feature on his iPhone, and he did another wonderful video showing bees at work in his garden in slow motion. That was great. And then he also had a fun video that showed some caladium. And Patricia asked him if he leaves his caladium bulbs out as a permanent planting. And Danny said he does not. In fact, the picture that he shared, the video of the caladium that he showed, that caladium is actually in a pot that he just drops into the ground. So come October, he just grabs the pot, pulls it all up, And that makes it so much easier for him to overwinter. That's a genius idea, Danny. After my recent echinacea episode, when I see echinacea now, I really key in on it. And listener Cindy Higley shared a great post by Cultivating Medicinal Herbs. And they showed a field of echinacea. And this was a field from an herb farm in North Carolina at sunset. It was just a breathtaking photo. Then listener John Brian Silverio shared pictures of his harvest for a second year of growing in his garden. In fact, his story was kind of funny because he said, I got involved in gardening by accident. I wasn't interested, but my coworker shoved a few extra baby plants she had in my arms last year, and I was hooked. I started everything from seed this year with a tiny LED shop light set up and ended up buying long fluorescent lights to accommodate the fast-growing plants. Too fast. It was a jungle in the guest bedroom, and the raised bed wasn't ready yet. He showed pictures of sweet peppers and eggplants, and then he wrote, he also has mixed lettuce, which his wife really enjoys. Now, here's something that came up in the conversation around John's post, and it was a great idea from Patricia Chandler Newport. I want to share it with you. John was talking about staking his tomatoes. And that's a legitimate challenge for people. And here's what Patricia said. I switched this year to cattle panels held up by T-posts. It looks very clean. And then John wrote back, he said, interesting. I can't find cattle panels at the local mega stores." And Patricia wrote back and said, do you have a tractor supply? Because that's where I get mine. They're $12.99 for a four by eight panel. That's a fantastic idea, Patricia. Listener Peter Langham shared gorgeous pictures of his firecracker zinnia, and they are firecrackers. And they remind me of some of my favorite echinacea that have that yellow flare around the cone because these zinnias have a yellow flare that encircles the center part of the zinnia. I love that. Natasha Onisak shared a great picture from the Ontario Science Center. That place has an IKEA grow room, and I shared that in the Garden News Roundup last year. Those grow rooms are so cool. They look like little spheres, and they have shelving and lighting all inside. They're just fantastic. And Natasha took a picture of her two little girls gardening inside the sphere. And she said, they call this one gardening pose. Anyway, the sphere looked fantastic. The daughters were adorable. And I love, love, love that Ikea grow room. That would be fantastic to get someday. And then finally, listener Robert Wilbright shared a great photo of some of the wildflowers he has growing in his yard. He had zinnias, cosmos, bachelor buttons, baby's breath, with some added borders of marigolds and salvia. Anyway, you could see the pictures of this cute little garden right through his window, and it looks like it's going gangbusters. So good job, Robert. In Listener Plant IDs, Sue Luthdig borrowed a seed pod from an abandoned house in her neighborhood, and she was wondering if any of us had any ideas. The verdict appears to be garlic seeds forming from the scape. Then listener Patricia Chandler Newport shared a very informative post. She wrote, Hi, everyone. I snapped these pictures today at work as a follow-up post to my post on poison ivy a while back. A couple of episodes ago, I shared a post that Patricia had written as a very good FYI post about poison ivy. She did a great job with it. And in this post, 
she's sharing a pretty wildflower slash weed that's called jewel weed. And here's what she wrote. Jewel weed is important to recognize as it commonly grows near poison ivy and it is nature's antidote to poison ivy. It works best when used as soon as you are exposed to the urochial, the oil in poison ivy. But it can also be somewhat soothing even after you get the rash. All you need to do is break open its fleshy stem and rub the sap wherever the poison ivy touched your skin. Voila, no itchy rash for you. This was an excellent tip, and if you've never seen jewelweed before, go ahead and look up Patricia's post in our Facebook group or Google it, jewelweed, one word. Finally, listener Ann Barklow had a question for the group. She said, with our hard South Carolina downpours, many of my perennials get beat to the ground. What are the best plant stakes that I can use next season to prevent the flowers from falling over? And listeners had many, many different suggestions about what to use. Carla Deanna shared her tip for peony steaks, and then both her and Patricia chimed in with their favorites from Gardener's Supply. And if you have favorites, go ahead and share them in the listener community. We'd love to hear about them. In listener love, Nias Eniak shared a great post about the Echinacea show. He wrote this, The Echinacea show came at the perfect time. I just read The Green Pharmacy by James Duke. He noted so many medicinal uses for Echinacea that I ordered some seeds. Never grown them, but really tempted to plant them. It was great to walk with my dogs and listen to the podcast. Now, at this point, he starts to reference my episode with Jody McKee, the fantastic herbalist that I interviewed local here in the Twin Cities. And I can tell that he paid attention because here's what he wrote. I got bit by a ton of mosquitoes on my walk. I started having a horrible itching attack, but I found some gigantic plantain weed, chewed it up, and rubbed the pulp on my bites and was immediately relieved. Thanks for the info. And then again, because the guests of the show are invited to be in the group, he was able to interact with Jody McKee directly. And Jody wrote this, I had a friend who was over a couple of weeks ago. She had a spider bite that was starting to really hurt, and it was red and swollen. I showed her the plantain poultice and had her change it every four hours. By the next night, she texted and said it hurt way less, and the redness and swelling were down. Plantain is amazing. And then Nias wrote, yes, it is. It tastes pretty good, too. I've been going down the herbalist rabbit hole recently, and I'm really enjoying it. And then a few days later, Kathleen Bonafonte wrote, this is awesome. I just learned of plantain after a nasty bee sting that every other method failed to reduce the swelling. So that's great. Herbs at their finest. And then within the listener community, I've started doing some pretty regular videos showing behind the scenes of the show. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what goes into putting the podcast together or just hearing about some commentary around the shows that have already been created or upcoming shows, it's fun for me to be able to share that stuff with you guys and then get your feedback and suggestions as well. I just love the listener community for the show, and it's so great for me to be able to interact with you in so many different ways and see posts from folks who share our passion for growing and have a curiosity to learn more. So come hang out with us. Don't be shy. Even if you've been listening for a while and wondering, is that group for me? Go ahead and check it out. It's so simple to be part of the group, and I'd love for you to join for free. It's totally totally free. The next time you're at Facebook, just type Still Growing Podcast into the search bar and request to join. I look forward to meeting you over in the group. Now, if you want to get a hold of the show, if you have questions or suggestions, there is a phone number you can call and it's 865-333-GROW or 865-333-GROW. Four seven six nine. I love listening to your comments and suggestions. 
All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. The Garden News Roundup is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments, from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with, and that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. I also cover news and information on specific topics Topic areas like sustainability and science. And then the other segments are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the How To DIY segment, the Continuing Ed segment, the Plant Spotlight, shopping, recipes, inspiration, and quotables. Now, what's great about this for you is that you get to stay up to date on the news in horticulture just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. In the guest update segment, past guest Megan Kane over at Creative Vegetable Gardener shared a wonderful blog post she wrote this past week. And when she shared it, she wrote this, It's my opinion that summer is the most difficult gardening season. That's why I love planting a fall garden. It's way easier to grow a lot of the vegetables you love. Now, When Megan shared this, I didn't have a chance to read it right away, and so I took my time, and a few days later, I just sat down and went through her post, and I thought it was excellent. So in case you missed it, I want to give you some of the highlights, but I especially want to read her introduction to you, because if you have had a difficult summer growing, you're going to find out just by reading the first couple of paragraphs of Megan's post that you're not alone. Here's what she wrote. And the title of this, by the way, is Why Growing a Fall Garden is So Easy. Before we talk about why growing a fall garden is so incredibly easy, let's commiserate about the frustrations of summer gardening. Let me show you two photos that pretty much sum up my summer garden so far. The first photo is showing her vegetable garden, and it's a close-up shot of some dead leaves on the ground. And here's what she wrote. This first shot is what 30 of my 45 pepper plants looked like a week ago. Did you hear that? 30 out of 45 plants. They were shedding leaves like crazy and hardly had any fruit on them. After frantically doing some research online, I discovered they most likely had bacterial speck. And the advice offered was to get rid of them immediately. So a few nights later, I pleaded with my husband to come out to the garden with me and assist me in ripping out all of the pepper plants in two garden beds and throw them into our trash bin. Ouch, it hurts just writing that. Okay, so that's the first tough situation Megan encountered this summer. Here's the second. The second photo shows a leaf that's been reduced to lace. And I know immediately what you're thinking. And Megan confirmed it. Here's what she wrote. The second photo shows Japanese beetles devouring the pretty pole bean trellis I built this spring. It was so easy to construct, and it adds just the touch of height I was looking for in that part of the garden. It's perfect, except for all of the holes in the leaves and the copulating beetles covering the vines. But don't worry, just below the trellis is a bucket full of water where I cast them to their deaths. Sorry to be so frank, but it's true. And then here's what Megan wrote, and I love this part. Okay, Megan, what's the moral of these stories? And here's her response. Gardening in the summer is difficult. Megan wrote, it's the season we anxiously wait for as gardeners, but it's often filled with disappointment and heartache. Japanese beetles, squash bugs, mosquitoes, potato beetles, the list of insects that attack us and our gardens is endless. Droughts, heat indexes of 103, hailstorms and thunderstorms, it feels like the weather just won't cooperate. It's no wonder then that at the end of summer, we feel exhausted. 
We start to feel like it's time to pack the gardening gloves away and call it a season. But if you quit now, you're going to miss out on one of the best and most underutilized seasons in the garden, the fall season. It just might be my favorite time in the garden. Why? Well, it's way easier to grow a fall garden than a summer one. Then Megan goes on to offer four reasons why growing a fall garden is way easier than a summer one, and I couldn't agree with her more. So I hope you check this article out and draw inspiration and wonderful practical information from Megan Kane over at Creative Vegetable Gardener. You can find the post over at her blog or in our Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. At the end of July, past guest Bryn Haas over at Creative Living and Growing shared the top seven peppers every gardener should grow. So these are the peppers that made Bryn's must-have list. Cayenne, Jalapeno, Serrano, Anaheim, Hungarian Yellow Wax, Golden Bell, and California Wonder. If you're curious about any of these, You can read the post for more information. Bryn did a great job of describing each of them and how she sources them. In sustainability, there was a great article that was called It's Wild Tree Bark Peeling. This was posted by Saxon Holt over at Gardening Gone Wild. And here's how it starts out. In California, some of our finest native trees and shrubs strip down and shed their bark. It's called exfoliation, and I swear it seems to happen overnight. And then Saxon goes on to say that scientists are not entirely sure how exfoliation evolved in the plant world. There's evidence that it's a protective measure against boring insects, but surely for these California natives in our summer dry climate, the bark break and peel is part of how they grow, a molting creature bursting a corset. When the bark peels back, there is invariably a greenish tint to the new layer, a new opportunity of photosynthesis for the plant before the skin toughens up for winter and the next rainy season. It was a very interesting article for someone like me who lives in the Midwest. We don't have trees that are exfoliating. And the images in this post were fantastic. You really get to see examples of that bark exfoliating off the tree. There was another great post in sustainability, and this one was from Garden Design Magazine over at Gardendesign.com. It's by Jenny Andrews, and the title of it is called Water Wisdom, an Eco-Friendly Santa Fe Garden. Frankly, I found this article to be so helpful from a design standpoint. I think it doesn't matter where you live, you should read this article. The post features a wonderful Santa Fe landscape designer named Donna Bone. Her company is called Design with Nature. And she's created a reputation for herself that she creates landscapes that are beautiful and regionally appropriate. And let me share an introduction to this project. So if you're a landscape designer, this is a very common scenario for you. You're walking up to a property, and this is how Donna saw this property when she first approached it before she had a chance to get in there and transform it. Here's what was written. When Donna first approached the site in 2005 in a neighborhood on the outskirts of the city, it was a typical lifeless post-construction wasteland. But the surrounding landscape was an inspiration, as was the architecture of the house, a modern stucco with clean lines and thoughtful connections between interior and exterior. The home's modest acreage, with narrow and zero lot lines, had an enviable borrowed landscape, an adjacent natural area, and a stunning view of the mountain range. The client's only requests were that the garden be contemporary, suited to the site, and low maintenance. And that's Donna's specialty. Past guest Pam Pennick, the author of The Water Saving Garden, and Donna Bone completely see eye to eye because Donna approaches her landscapes with a heightened water consciousness. She's all about water-saving gardens. And here's something else that Donna does right. Listen to this. With a bit of a chemist in her, Donna's first step in designing any garden is to have the soil tested. Then she creates a customized site-specific fertilizing program with the soil mix fixed, 
Donna then contours and sculpts it into berms and swales. And while these add visual interest and dimensionality, they're actually part of a technique called passive water harvesting. Water is channeled directly to the roots of the plants, allowing plenty of time to soak in and making the most of every bit of moisture. And if you want examples of berms and swales, there are a ton in Pam Pennick's book. And then here's another idea that Donna had for this landscape. Her plan was to keep the garden areas refined nearest the home and more complex and natural the further out you go as a way of connecting the chic modern building to the wild landscape. And then this was my favorite part. To further connect designed landscape and native, Donna seeded the same plants on each side of this see-through boundary line, as if the no-mo constructed meadow that occupies the side garden and the back garden has jumped the fence. Isn't that genius? I loved that idea. And then this post wraps up with a great quote by Dave Gronfeld, the director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association. Here's what he wrote. There is enough water here for sensible gardening, a sensible river, and sensible people. It just takes the continued efforts of people like Donna, one garden, and one drop of water at a time. Man, did I love this post. There's so much information here. If you're interested in creating a water-saving garden or you live in an area where you have regular drought, arid conditions, this one is a must-read. In Continuing Ed, Great Dixter shared the three different potatoes that they grow, but the one they enjoy most is Picasso. This is the potato that they grow for baking, and they're very passionate about it. They say it makes a great baked potato. So the Picasso potato, add it to your list. Also in Continuing Ed, there was a wonderful little short video featuring Dr. Alan Armitage, and he was talking about a technique he uses when he's asked to help with a plant ID. And his first suggestion is to start by ruling out the things the plant is not. And then he goes on to share a story of what makes flocks flocks. It's a fun little video. Beth Engel shared a great little post on the PPA Symposium. PPA stands for Perennial Plant Association, and they just wrapped up their annual symposium in Denver. And next year, it will be in Raleigh, North Carolina. Tony Avent of Plant Delights Nursery is head of the local site committee. And Beth says next year's conference is going to be a blast. Great tours, lectures, and camaraderie. So add it to your calendar. Diane Mishler wrote a wonderful post over at planttherapy.com. She recently visited the Lavender Festival in Washington State. Can you imagine? Diane gives a wonderful overview of growing lavender and then how they extract the essential oil. And my personal favorite is how they hand bundled this lavender and then hung them in the barns to dry. It's like this gorgeous lavender garland. You have to see these pictures. They're gorgeous. Erica Massini over at MyChicagoBotanic.org shared five tips to make your garden a Brazilian paradise. Of course, one of the themes over at the Chicago Botanic is the gardens of Brazil, so this post was appropriate. And there are great ideas for how you can grow a Brazil-inspired tropical garden. Some great plant suggestions here. Also over at Chicago Botanic was a sassy little article that was called How to Grow More Amazing Dahlias Than Your Neighbors. So if you're competitive about your dahlias, this one's right up your alley. And of course, the American Dahlia Society National Show is at the Chicago Botanic Garden this September, the 9th and the 10th. And there'll be over 2,000 dahlia flowers on display. That will be exciting. And did you know dahlias are indigenous to Mexico? Well, they are. And they were grown by the Aztecs who used the tubers as one of their staple foods. Dahlias as edibles. That's something I have not read about. Finally, in continuing ed, Hartley Botanic shared a fun post that's called A Plant's Not Dead Until It's Warm and Dead. John Fisher shares his observations. And this was by Mary-Kate Mackey. Now, what I loved about this post is that John Fisher, a retired meteorologist and garden writer, just shared his observations, his own learnings 
from his years of gardening experience. Looking back, he says, I have learned that a lot of what I knew was wrong. And here are some of his wonderful takeaways. First, study your own growing conditions. There are so many variables in the microclimates and soil structure around your house. Just because your neighbor can or can't grow something doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Second, plant trees in native soil. John does not like to amend the soil in the planting hole. Now he says it's native soil, period. And then third, he writes, weed what you need. I loved this one. John likes to ask himself, where do I want to put my weeding energy? For instance, not all vegetables require the same care. Onions and carrots must be weed-free, but zucchini and corn will outperform the weeds. John offers a few more great points in this post, and I love those life lessons, those takeaways from years spent gardening. In the How To DIY segment was a post that I absolutely loved, and it was by Helen Battersby of the garden blog Toronto Gardens. The title of the post was called Make Yourself a Deadhead Bouquet. And Helen writes, If you think of deadheading as a gardening chore, it's because you're doing it too late. Doing it after the flowers fade gives you all the work and none of the benefits. So Helen advises making yourself a deadhead bouquet, clipping the flowers before they're dead and turning them into a bouquet, saving yourself the work of deadheading. It's a great perspective. And I wrote, timing really is everything. I shared a fun video in the Facebook group this week. It was by Family Food Garden, and it was talking about how to make an herb spiral. It had step-by-step instructions. Herb spirals are very beautiful. You have this mounded up spiral, this spiral that gradually goes up, and there's usually rocks that are creating the circle, small boulders. And as you get to the top, you're at literally at the top of a mountain. And of course, with all of that mounding up, you're creating wonderful drainage. And so many herbs like that well-drained soil. The herb spiral naturally gives it to them, especially the higher up you go on the spiral. Conversely, the bottom is cooler, shadier, and moist. And of course, the middle is in between the two. So herbs that need the drier soil are up on top, and plants that want wetter conditions enjoy hanging out on the lower part of the herb spiral. This video offered a step-by-step instruction for how to build the herb spiral, and I thought it was wonderful. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. Also in the How To DIY segment was a great post called How to Propagate Lavender from Plant Cuttings. It's so simple. In the plant spotlight, Woodland Essence shared a great post on black cohosh, a plant they call fairy wands. And it's a power pollinator plant. I loved this video. Those bees were just swarming those blooms. And speaking of pollinator plants, Barbara's Blossoms, Butterflies, and Birds shared a great video of a field of zinnias. And it was so gorgeous. There was this endless row of zinnias, and there were just hundreds of butterflies all over the flowers. It was amazing. Another great reason to be on Team Zinnia. One of the more memorable videos that I shared this week featured Deborah Lee Baldwin with Shauna Coronado and Laura Eubanks. This was actually a video that past guest Laura Eubanks had shared over on her YouTube channel, Design for Serenity. And these gals shot this video last year, but the content is evergreen and it's a standout in my mind. And here's why. Deborah Lee Baldwin is showing the gals the fleshiest succulent. And Deborah Lee Baldwin, of course, is the succulent queen. And what she does in this video is she shows a plant that probably best illustrates what succulents are all about, the fact that they store water in their leaves. So she takes a piece of this tongue-shaped ice plant called Glottophyllum lingmaform. She just rips off a chunk, holds it in her hand, and begins to wring it out like you would a dish rag. And water is just pouring out. It's almost unbelievable when you see it. That was a super fun video. Also in the plant spotlight is a post from Bless My Weeds, and it's called 12 Plants That Will Bring the Hummingbirds to Your Garden. Among them are bee balm, delphinium, flowering tobacco, the appropriately named hummingbird mint, and yarrow. 
In the news segment this week, Tracy Blevins of Plants Map noted that 2018 will be the year of the beet from the National Garden Bureau. And she shared a cute little picture of their tablecloth at the Garden Writers Association conference. And it said, what did the carrot say to the wheat? Let us rest. I'm feeling beet. So cute. Be thinking about beets for your 2018 garden. You'll be totally in step with the year of the beet. Then there was an incredible post shared over at SB Nation, and the title of it was called, I Watched in Bewilderment While a Man Tried to Return Butternut Squash to the Grocery Store Because He Thought He Had Bought Cheese. So you're probably thinking, how did this happen? Well, the butternut squash had been cubed, and so it's got that golden color, and it looks like cheese, and this gentleman thought he had bought cheese and not butternut squash. Of course, he missed the label that said butternut squash. He didn't look at it closely. Anyway, this was kind of a humorous article to read. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Also in the news this week was a post that was shared by Garden in a City, Jason and Judy over at Garden in a City. And they shared an overview of a blog post by Humane Gardener that shared an interview with a garden designer named Annie White. And for her doctoral research, White had conducted an experiment to determine whether pollinators had preferences for straight species native plants as opposed to named cultivars bred from native plants known as nativars. And her results were mixed. For six of the 12 species that she tested, pollinators had a clear preference for the straight species. For four of the species, there was no difference. And in one case, the pollinators actually preferred the cultivar to the straight species. Interesting. And probably a good indication that more research needs to be done. Also in the news, Horticulture Week shared a great post. This one was about houseplants. And it features TV presenter and writer Alice Fowler, who says that gardeners need to look after houseplants and not just use them as decor and then throw them away. Great article here if you love houseplants. And of course, Fowler has written the book Plant Love as a guide to the benefits of houseplants. Great advice in that book. In the Dream Guest segment this week is Kayla Haupt of Under a Tin Roof in Kelowna, Iowa. Kayla is the winner of the 2017 Gardenista Considered Design Award, and she won for Best Edible Garden. Kayla blogs at Under a Tin Roof in Kelowna, Iowa, and when you see her gorgeous vegetable garden, you're going to be so inspired. Kayla's homestead was started after a family passion to grow their own food began early in the year, and with a collection of creative engineering, design, and a love of plants and sustainability, the homestead grew into a garden and a greenhouse, and the greenhouse is so sweet, absolutely gorgeous. It's no wonder she won the award. And when I shared it in the group, I said, looks like the still growing tour bus will be heading to Kelowna, Iowa in 2018. I'd love to see this garden in person. In Science This Week, Savvy Gardening shared a post called Five Surprising Facts About Ladybugs You Don't Know. And fact number one drew my attention. And here's what the post said. Did you know that ladybugs leave behind a chemical footprint as they walk around looking for their prey? The footprint is a type of volatile odor. When another predatory insect is out hunting for prey on the same plant, it smells the ladybug's footprint and may decide not to lay eggs anywhere nearby. When I shared this post in the community, Patricia Chandler Newport said, I knew they had an odor, but not specifically from their feet. When Asian ladybugs congregated inside my house one winter, there was a distinct odor. And that's true. Also in Science This Week was a great post by Michigan State University Extension called The Rise and Fall of the Webworm. This is a timely post to revisit because it's August and it's time for the annual visit of this harmless showstopper known as the Fall Webworm. And if you've ever seen the webworm encase a branch of shrubbery with their beautiful webs, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Great post here. Two posts made the shopping segment this week. The first was from Urban Gardens, and they shared these low-tech Egyptian artisan clay pots that help you water your plants for a month. These are available on Amazon. They're low-tech, and they're a great system to put in place, especially if you have to go on vacation. And then Gardenista.com shared a gorgeous outdoor shower called the Lyman Outdoor Shower. 
Now, this simple design is quite expensive if you want to buy it directly from the manufacturer, but I also think it can be replicated using materials from your local hardware store. So check it out for inspiration if you're a DIYer. In inspiration this week is a gorgeous post from Gardenista. It's a garden on the edge of Wales, and it's known as Brian's Ground. When I shared it in the group, I said, cue the drooling. This garden is gorgeous. Lots of inspiring images in this post. And then Gardenista also shared something they call the outbuilding of the week. It was a tiny summer house in southern London. This post is great inspiration if you're considering up-leveling your garden shed. And when I shared it with the group, I wrote, next time someone asks you what you'd like for a gift, just say you'd like a tiny summer house. It seems like such a reasonable request. There are lots of great ideas in this post for how to transform the inside of your garden shed. Earlier this month, the garden writers were in Buffalo, New York for their annual symposium. And they had put together a very inspiring video, giving us a sneak peek into the gardens of Buffalo. That got shared in the group this week. And for anyone who couldn't attend, it gives you a sneak peek into the gorgeous spaces that they saw in Buffalo. Buffalo loves gardening. Also an inspiration this week, London Gardens on Twitter shared an adorable picture of these cats that were hiding in a boxwood. And as someone would ruffle the top of the boxwood, these cats would emerge and bat at the hand. It was just adorable. Botanical Brouhaha shared a beautiful post showing how to integrate balloons into your floral bouquets and other creations. This is a very creative post. If you're hosting any type of party or major event, consider incorporating balloons into your floral creations. And then finally an inspiration, Patterson Webster wrote a post about an area she calls the Upper Room. This is a beautiful honoring space that Patterson created. It was one of her goals for 2017, and the area honors her mother and her beliefs. She started working on this area of her garden last summer, and this year she finally completed it. If you're looking for ideas for a wonderfully serene and honoring memorial space, This post has lots of great ideas. One of my favorite features is this sand-blasted panel display that is the central feature of this garden. And on this sand-blasted panel, Patterson had them design the spreading limbs of a dogwood tree. And I love what she wrote here. She said, the spreading limbs of a dogwood tree remind me of Virginia and my mother's outstretched arms. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a wonderful space. And I would say that Patterson accomplished her goal for the upper room. So great job, Patterson. In recipes, my friend Jen McGinnis over at Frau Zinni shared her Shiro plum coffee cake recipe. Jen has a beautiful plum tree and she harvests it every year and makes this wonderful recipe. It's basically a fruit-topped crumb coffee cake, and it looks delicious. She says she loves it. In the quote segment this week, I thought it would be fitting if I picked quotes about the plant explorers. I'll kick it off here with one by Thomas Jefferson. He wrote, The greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. And then here's one from John Bartram. Whatsoever, whether great or small, ugly or handsome, sweet or stinking, everything in the universe, in their own nature, appears beautiful to me. Here's one by William Bartram. My progress was rendered delightful by the sylvan elegance of the groves, cheerful meadows, and high distant forests, which in grand order presented themselves to view. And then here are two good ones from David Douglas. A forest of these trees is a spectacle too much for one man to see. And then the joy of viewing land, the hope of in a few days ranging through the long wished for spot and the pleasure of again resuming my wanted employment may be readily calculated. And then here are a few gems from Robert Fortune. 
Nature generally struggles against this treatment for a while until her powers seem in a great measure exhausted when she quietly yields to the power of the art. And then here Robert's talking about bonsai. The Chinese, by their favorite system of dwarfing, contrive to make it when only a foot and a half or two feet high have all the characters of an aged cedar of Lebanon. And then there were these two quotes about the Chinese love of gardening. So high do these plants stand in the favor of the Chinese gardener that he will cultivate them extensively, even against the wishes of his employer, and in many cases, rather leave his situation than give up the growth of his favorite flower. And then finally, one marked feature of the people, both high and low, is a love for flowers. Here's one by Ernest Henry Wilson. How much the making of a garden, no matter how small, adds to the joy of living, only those who practice the arts and the science can know. Finally, here are some documented quotes by Frank Meyer. And then these I like because they really give us a glimpse into what it was like to be a plant explorer. Here we go. The loneliness of life. The great amount of work I have to do, which I can never finish. The paralyzing effects of this never-ending horrible war and so many another thing. These often rob me of my sleep and make me feel like a ship adrift. That was written during Frank's South China Expedition in 1917. And then here he is replying to a U.S. request for opium seed in April of 1917. You probably know that poppy cultivation has been totally prohibited in all China, and that poppy seed is absolute contraband for which farmers have been beheaded who had it in their possession. And then this was actually something that David Fairchild had written to Meyer after Meyer had reported that he was suffering a nervous breakdown. This letter was written to him on June 29, 1917. Do not forget that we consider the knowledge which you have accumulated a most valuable asset. You have begun a great work, and it would be a tremendous pity not to carry it further particularly during these strenuous times. The following month, he wrote Meyer this. You speak in one of your recent letters of wishing you had someone to advise you. My dear Meyer, these are times when we all need advice. But unfortunately, there are times when those who try to advise feel incompetent to do so. I might easily advise you to come back to this country and to take up the breeding of plants, but I do not feel sure that a man of your restless disposition will be contented with the necessarily quiet life of a plant breeder. I'll let you hear about the fate of Meyer in Karen Rexrod's presentation, but I thought these quotes from Meyer's final letter in 1918 were particularly poignant. Yes, Mr. Fairchild, it often seems that we do not live ourselves any longer, but that we are being lived. Uncontrollable forces seem to be at work among humanity, and final results, or possibly purposes, are not being revealed as yet. That is, for so far as I can look into this whole titanic cataclysm. I hope you enjoyed those quotes from The Plant Explorers. I think they give us a little insight into their thoughts and feelings and their perspective on their work and the world, what it was like for them. And it's a nice way to set the stage for the topic of today's show. Well, that's the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder that you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed. If you join the listener community for the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group, I'd love to meet you in the group. 
With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show. Prominent horticulturist, garden speaker, and creative force, Karen Rexrode, and an encore of her presentation, Plant Explorers. Today, I am so very honored to have Karen Rexroad on the show. I had the opportunity to listen to Karen give her presentation on plant explorers during the Garden Bloggers Fling, because Karen was the keynote on Saturday night. And I have to say, I listened to Karen speak that night with you in mind the entire time. I hear from listeners all the time that they love the history of plants. So this show will be a special source of enjoyment for you. Not only is Karen a knowledgeable horticulturist, she's also a noted photographer in the Washington metropolitan area for many years. Karen owned and operated Windy Hill Plant Farm in Loudoun County for 25 years, and her specialty was perennials and unusual plants. After Karen closed her nursery in 2005, she traveled for a year to pursue her photography interests before joining the staff at the historic Virginia estate Oak Hill. She also maintains a small estate in Warrenton, originally designed by Donna Hackman of Middleburg, Virginia. Karen has taught at Green Spring Gardens. She's a frequent speaker at garden clubs and conferences. And she co-hosted the Maryfield Garden Center's Gardening Advisor television program. Karen's a very busy lady because in addition to maintaining these estate gardens, she writes gardening articles, and you'll hear her talk about that during our conversation. But every month, she puts together gardening articles that are published in the eccentric newspaper where she doles out advice for local gardeners under the surname of The Plant Lady. You're going to love listening to Karen's presentation on The Plant Explorers from John Tradescant in 1637 to Joseph Rock in the 1960s. Karen's talk is a truly fascinating look at these intrepid men. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude. It's thanks to their efforts that the plants we enjoy today were discovered all those years ago in remote and often dangerous, uncharted parts of the world. And it's thanks to their indefatigable determination that these plant discoveries were carefully documented, packaged, and brought out of the wild, out of obscurity, and into our gardens and our hearts. The Plant Explorers with Karen Rexrode. Enjoy. Well, hi there, Karen. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to get a chance to talk to you after meeting you at this year's Garden Bloggers Fling in the D.C. area. We first got a chance to ride on the back of a bus together. Yes, and, we did. <laughs> which was which was a little bumpy. And also, we were under the air conditioning units. We were getting a little bit of water dripping on us at the time as yeah, well. Yeah, but we still, we still had a good time. We did. We had a great time. And we also had the chance, all of the Garden Blogger Flingers, to hear you speak. You were our keynote speaker that night. And I thought you did such a wonderful job. You're your presentation was all about the plant hunters, and you had all of us in the palm of your hand. And so I knew when I was listening to you that night, I thought, oh, I just have to see if Karen would come on the show and give this presentation to an even bigger audience. So I'm so delighted to have you on the show today. And before we get started, why don't you take a few minutes and tell us about yourself because you have a very fascinating history yourself. Thank you, Jennifer. I feel like I've been in every part of horticulture that there could possibly be. I started at the age of 21 at working at a nursery And I started, I was going to college at night and I was working in the nursery by day. And I was started as a cashier, knowing nothing. I mean, I thought I knew something, but it turns out I knew nothing. (laughs) So I was answering the phones, which was very, very difficult. (laughs) Well, anyway, I moved, (laughs) I moved my way through at that nursery and to, to managing their tropical houses, greenhouses. But 
I remember from the very beginning, from maybe maybe even the first week that I was there, certainly the first month, that I was curious about plant exploration. Always have been. I would go on my lunch break to the library and check out books. And I remember reading about Henry Wilson even, you know, way back then and just being curious about the whole thing. But anyway, I worked my way into being in charge of their tropical greenhouses. And I did that for uh, probably four, four and a half years. And then we were slowly, me and my husband were buying property on the family farm. So we had gotten to where we were up to 10 acres. And then I was, I was pregnant with my daughter. And I've spent my entire life moving. I have moved because my father worked for the CIA. We would move every two to four years. Okay. And I had in, in that time, I mean, I remember living in Germany as a little girl and knowing, you know, how to speak German fluently. And then later we lived in Okinawa. I did not learn Japanese. We were very insulated in that community. But we then lived in Mexico. I spoke Spanish. I had learned and spoke Spanish fluently then all through high school. When I realized that I was going to leave this nursery and have have a child, that horticulture and the language of horticulture was something that this time I was not going to give up. Mm-hmm. So I started my own nursery. And I started my own nursery on the 10 acres. Uh, we slowly, over time, bought more land and more land and more land. And my, my nursery at the beginning was wholesale only, so I could propagate and just didn't have to worry about a retail hours and situation. And then eventually we decided to go retail and we needed to move because we had a water urgency. We needed so much water to be able to maintain the inventory. So we had a, there was a three-acre pond on the family farm. We ended up moving and it was roadside frontage. So we moved down to the road to Route 50, opened up the nursery, and we would pump water out of the three-acre pond. And I ended up also, my son was born a couple years later, but I had started my nursery. And the nursery ended up, we had a catalog every year, and the catalog was published or written by me, and it was themed every single year. And so the themes ran everything from, I did the pollinator garden in 1997. I did a year of vines, I did a fragrance, I did a grandmother's garden, but I never forgot the plant explorers. So I did a plant explorers catalog, men in horticulture it was called, and I just revisited all of that again. And then now I lecture quite often on the topic, and the lecture you heard was just another, I, I'm constantly redoing it and constantly changing the players sort of just to make it be connected. I want it to be connected between, you know, seven degrees of separation. Who's Who knows who and how did they get there? So that was kind of how it came together, the lecture itself. And, my, and that's basically my history. I closed my nursery in 2005. And now I work as an estate gardener and I work at a big retail garden center on the weekends. Well, Karen, as I'm listening to you and your fascinating history, I'm thinking of this song called It's All Been Done Before. And you have to kind of feel that way when you're talking about the way that you handled your catalog for your Windy Hill plant farm, your nursery, because nobody was doing that at the time, were they? Were they introducing like these themes and catalogs on an annual basis? Nobody was doing it because I can tell you it is such an amount of work. And when I closed my nursery, I closed it. I mean, at that point, I can say I was really, really tired. (laughs) I felt really burnt out, yeah. and and the the theme, the one year we did the night garden, the theme would drive what we sold. It would mm-hmm. drive everything we did for that year. So mm-hmm. the night garden, we ended up growing tropicals two years in advance in our big greenhouse, so we could plant them out in the garden for the for the night garden year, and we were open three nights, full moon nights that summer. And people would come. I said I would be open until 9 at night. I ended up every time being open till 11. And I I just think back to the exhaustion of, you know, maintaining that. But I wanted people to learn. And that was, I felt, how else could you do? uh, The catalog was 56 to 60 pages. It was two months of my winter 
to to write it and then to 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 I did the desktop publishing. I did all of it. So so it was just a it, but it was the only way I would do it. So, you know, there's no regrets, of course. And pollinator plants. I mean, even even themes like pollinator plants. Do you recall any other themes that you had that you're seeing a new interest in nowadays? I did one on geology. So it, it talked a whole lot about the physiographic regions of Virginia and Maryland, because, of course, I'm in Virginia and we had a, we had a lot of Maryland customers. Uh, I did one one year that I loved, and and it was one of my most popular years, and it was called the Grandmother's Garden. Oh. And I did it because I had a 14-year-old girl helping me, and she was asking me about a plant one day, and I don't remember what it was. It may have been a columbine. It may have been a hollyhock. So I started to tell her about the plants, and I said, you know, it's the kind of plant you'd find in your grandmother's garden. And she said, not my grandmother. She's in a retirement community in Florida. <laughs> And it dawned, it dawned on me that maybe this would be going away. The concept of your grandmother's garden, the way we, we remember it, you know, at least me, my age, because I remember fondly my grandmother's garden. So anyway, it, that was another theme that just popped up that was one of people's favorites, absolutely. I'm sure that there are people listening right now that are landscape designers or nursery owner operators who are listening to this and they're drawing inspiration from this lifetime of experience you had with your own nursery. Well, horticulture is very exciting. I mean, oh my gosh, it's just never ending. That's why we love it. I mean, you'll never be bored. That's for sure. One of the things I so appreciated about listening to your presentation on the Plant Explorers was that you did a marvelous job sharing all the different connections that each of these plantsmen had with one another or with other very important people during their time. They weren't working in isolation, were they? You know, in the very beginning, I did introduce John Dratiscant, and he, he was working on his own. He was collecting for himself. But otherwise, after that, no, nobody was what you would call self-employed. They were all employed by someone, and they were being funded by someone. Yes, the patronage was very important to them. And the reasons even to for for whatever organization was paying for them, the reasons why they were going. And that was very often, it wasn't just one organization. It would be up to three, maybe more, who wanted a piece of the pie, who wanted them to also collect for them and add seed, you know, collecting seed for just different organizations or arboretums or even nurseries. It was fascinating. And I think I especially liked your presentation because I'm an amateur genealogist. So I love hearing about the histories of different people, whether they're plantsmen or not. And so I found your presentation very interesting. And I know as I talk to listeners of the show, they also share this passion for learning the history of plants and the people that were discovering these plants. So what I'd love for you to do right now is kick off this presentation. Give us kind of the big picture, what the presentation is about, kind of the scope of this, and then let's walk through it. Okay, so it starts early. I started with John Tradescant in 16, well, he was born in 1637. It goes through 18 different individuals. Uh, what I was really personally interested in was if a nursery per se hired this explorer, then or the Department of Agriculture or the, the British Royal Horticulture Society, which was at the time called the Horticultural Society of London. So when they were hired, how did they find out about where they were about to go? Who did they talk to? Who did they connect to? How did they learn? You know, that was one of the things. How did they learn about where they wanted to go? But also, what kind of organization was sending them and funding them? The most, I think one of the most interesting things as to why we even know so much about these individuals is that a requirement for them was to keep a journal. And in keeping a journal, that became the articles that were published when they got home. These journals are beautiful. I showed some examples of them because they were literally, they were before we had photography, they had to do drawings. The drawings would be to some sort of scale. 
And that was how the world was introduced to places and plants and not just plants, but but everything from insects. And that was the other thing is that these people, by and large, were not just interested in horticulture, but they were interested in geology and insects. And they had to know about the habitat of the plant because that was a large part of what would make it succeed when it came home to wherever home was. So that's kind of an overview and and how I looked at it when I started as to why I selected who I selected. Well, let's kick it off. We're going to begin your presentation, and it's simply called Plant Explorers. So I show a couple books, and I recommended a couple books to the group because I found them so inspiring. And the first book that I show is the one that inspired me the most, and it's just called The Plant Hunters by Tyler Whittle. It's just an incredible read. I would say it's probably of all, and I have a lot of books on plant exploration. It's my favorite. So I just I just sort of mentioned it. And then another book I mentioned is A Reunion of Trees by Stephen Spongberg, and that's from Arnold Arboretum. Arnold Arboretum plays a huge part at Harvard University of the whole travelers and even funding. And a lot of explorers may have started somewhere else, but they quite a few of them ended up at Arnold. So I introduced with those two books. And then the last one I mentioned is the Longwood Gardens book, which is by Tomas Anisko. And that book kind of goes through the history of Longwood Gardens, their exploration. And the, and I went and hear, heard a presentation by Tomas. And the first thing he said was the book that inspired him to write this book was one he had read as a child, which was Plant Hunters by Tyler Whittle. So that book inspired him enough to become an explorer and to actually write the book for Longwood. So that's sort of how I started in a nutshell. And we start with the first Well, I showed a picture of Walter Hodge and the presentation that was given at Longwood. Do you remember that? Or you're you're seeing that on your computer, right? Yes, a picture of Dr. Walter Hodge, who passed away in 2013. Right. And so what Longwood Gardens did was they had a symposium. And it was a day you could spend with some of their plant explorers. And it was sort of a kickoff for the book that Tomas had written, and the explorers were interviewed, and it was completely informal, just chattering away on stage. They would talk about the countries they went to. They would talk about when things were rough and what what reasons even they chose the countries that they would go to, and Walter Hodge was hilarious. He went to Dominica, and he talked about why. He talked about the fact that it had such an incredible range of topography, a geography that he wanted to go there because it had everything from mountains to ocean. And he was fascinating. And I remember doing the research for the fling presentation and finding out that he had passed away. And I was so sad because I thought he was just so entertaining and so funny. And I just absolutely adored, adored him. And then there was a, a picture, another slide that came up of his wife that I found on the internet as she's literally drying the plants where they're pressing them into the papers and they have the wooden frames that they would bind as they would press the plants. And that was also, you know, wonderful to be able to find an old black and white picture of his wife as she's working there in Dominica. So anyway, I I just was really taken with the whole day at Longwood. I thought it was one of the best things. And at the end of the day, we all took our books and went around and every explorer that was there was signed. And it wasn't all 50 there, which the book has 50 in it, but it was, you know, a lot of them. And it was just, it was so nice to be in amongst them. It was just a lot of fun. So otherwise, I started the presentation with John Tradescant. Uh, He was born in 1637. I think his time here was, he came to Virginia and to Maryland. I find it funny, you know, you look at or you hear about the plants that they collected. He was from England. So what he took back to England was bald cypress. Of course, we know the plant, Tradescantia. So that was one he took. But the other thing you can read he took back to England was poison ivy, which always gives people a chuckle. Yes. He thought it was beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, and I mean, we all know in the fall it is beautiful. I mean, I'm thinking maybe he saw it in the fall and... Maybe he didn't get poison ivy. I don't know. He was the only person that I talk about that was what I would call self-employed. 
he came and he uh, and his son ended up also coming to Virginia. They love Virginia. Well, next up is John Bartram. He was considered the first native-born American to devote his entire life to the study of nature. He was a practical man, a scientist, and among his subjects was the Venus flytrap. So, and John Bartram was often called America's first botanist, and he was absolutely a fascinating human being. And you, you'll often see when you're when you're reading about these different individuals, one thing that they kind of had in, in common is that they were just so intellectual and smart and self-trained. And this is, is no different the case here. He was a Quaker and he had a large family and he had decided that he didn't want to farm. And he went off to collect plants. But the good thing about his timing was Linnaeus had just published Species Plantarium. And so there was the first understanding of how we would, what we would call a name, how a uh, name a plant, what we would use. Because before, literally, it, would, it might be an entire paragraph in Latin, which would just describe the plant. And now we were only using two genus species. So he was fascinating. Timing was perfect for him. He went and picked up the book, and that became what excited him because now he had a reason to go out and to explore and to know how to name the plants. But the best thing of all was he developed a relationship with Collinson in England, and Collinson was just desperate for plants from the New World to be able to offer to people in England. So they struck a deal where Bartram was paid by Collinson to send cuttings, to send seed, uh, and he would do that. And they had a long, long relationship, and that was how Bartram was able to make the money to support his family. And I'm looking here, as I'm looking at your images, I'm also looking online. When you Google John Bartram, the first thing that comes up is this quote by Linnaeus, who referred to him as the greatest natural botanist in the world. Did they correspond with each other? They did. And I, I seem to recall something to the fact that Bartram, you know, had such respect for him. And that you have to realize we didn't have email. We didn't have anything where we could connect like that. So everything was through lengthy letters that were written and then had to be mailed. And there was correspondence between quite a few of them with such respect they had for each other. I mean, they were basically rock stars to them, you know, yeah, if you think about it. Absolutely. And they would be just so happy to be able to correspond with them. And if you think about it, I mean, the fact that he lived in that time and he was able to do that, again, it's just wonderful. And you can see also, I showed in the presentation some of the drawings from his journals. And again, I mean, there's there's the one of a moth that's beautiful. And he, he gives you the Latin name for the genus. But the fact that he had Collinson to work with was what made him be able to do what he was able to do. And some of the plants that he's most famous for, the pawpaw is one and the Franklinia was another. It was a very mutual relationship for the two of them. And as you're showing the drawings that John did in his journal, it is so striking to think how multi-talented these explorers were. Then when you see their journals and you just see the sheer amount of skill that these people had. Well, and that's, you know, the the, the attention to detail. They were self-taught. So, you know, they would just pay attention to just absolutely everything. You see the same thing in Lewis and Clark's journals. And the interesting thing, one of the one of the people that I spoke about, but I just sort of skimmed over him was William Lobb. And the reason I was kind of curious as to why there's not that much information about, from him, but it turns out he was not required to keep a journal. So his sort of his meanderings and his, his collections are to some degree mysterious because he didn't have to keep a journal. Now, I'm not saying that Bartram had to keep a journal. He kept one, I'm sure. But it, after that, for Lewis and Clark, as we go on, they were required to keep a journal. And that's really what makes all this information accessible. And for you to see what they were seeing and to understand their attention to detail, their measurements. This was, you know, before photography. So this is all we had to go on. 
Yeah, it's really quite amazing. And as you were mentioning the fact that they're self-taught, they had to painstakingly devote themselves to whatever it is they wanted to accomplish. Well, and how do you key out a plant if you've never seen it before? (laughs) Think of the difficulty. They would have to be reading everybody else's, whatever they published, whatever was published in order to figure out that this plant is this genus. I mean, we're talking such a challenge. I still, to to this day, I'm just jaw dropped that they could do that, that they could go and botanize vast acres of land and figure out what occupied that land just by picking up a plant and looking and say, oh, this is a, you know, whatever it is. And no. This is where family professions become important because your teachers, in many cases, were mom and dad. And John Bartram, no doubt, had a huge influence on his son, William, and that's the next explorer. Right. And William ended up, Collinson at that point wasn't, wasn't uh, around anymore, maybe, I don't know, or, or doing business or alive, but he ended up working with other customers in England and even seed companies. So he kept on doing the same thing. And I'm sure, and yes, he traveled with his father. And I did actually read something where the Franklinia that they collected, the stand that they collected, which they did together, where they collected the Franklinia. And that was the other thing. So they would find a plant and they would have to go back later and get the seed. You know, think about that. They had to map it. And in many cases, there were no maps. But that stand where he first collected the seed, when they went back to see it, was gone. Oh. So so some may even say if it hadn't been for them collecting it, the plant wouldn't even be around. Yeah, so that was also fascinating. And then we move on to Lewis and Clark. And, and I should just say that we could spend, we could have spent the entire hour just talking about any one of these people. But Lewis and Clark sort of began the cycle of connections. And Lewis and Clark, as we know, were hired by Thomas Jefferson. Lewis's mother was an herbalist, and he had uh, a history as a military officer. And then he chose William Clark, who was another naturalist. And then they traveled with Sacagawea, which we all know the story, but they were they were sent out to explore the Louisiana territory that just been bought and they were responsible for everything not just plants they had to map it they had to understand the people that lived there they learned from the indians about arable uses of plants they went all the way to the ocean and his journals oh my gosh if you go online and look at some of the things he drew i mean just again this was how we learned and they kept a journal and when they came back the whole world knew a lot more than they knew before, but it, it it sort of spawned this curiosity because they they had researched this big territory and made it all the way to the redwoods in California and, and the West Coast and so many drawings of so many things, the animals that people had never seen before, fish that people had never seen before. Absolutely fascinating. And that began, I think, the real story that involved other countries, other institutions. Yes, that's right. And that is the perfect segue to our next explorer, David Douglas. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And he received a commission from the Royal Horticultural Society of London, and he made three trips to North America. David Douglas would be probably the individual that I would have happily spent the entire hour talking about because he was absolutely fascinating. And he, he, he was sent because Lewis and Clark had just come back from their trip and all these, these different publications were being sent out. And David Douglas was really, really a hardcore guy. And he was hired by the Royal Horticulture Society to bring seeds back from some of the big trees and conifers in particular. He's known for the Douglas fir. That's how we can link his name to to plants, but he ended up, and I said this in the presentation, twice I read, he got to such dire straits that he actually had to kill his horse and eat it. He was starving, which is a sad, sad, I can't even imagine. And he was very influential, but the most, maybe the most fascinating thing about his story 
was that he was writing a journal and he was collecting seeds and digging up young saplings to send back to England. And he kept making notes in his journal about the ground had odd gold specks in it. And he knew it was gold, but he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in the plants. And it was 17 years later that we have the gold rush. (laughs) So, you know, here's a man that struggles constantly to get by tough times. And here he is (laughs) realizing that there's gold in the ground and it just doesn't stop him. He keeps going with the plants. (laughs) So, and he ended up dying in Hawaii in a pit with a bull, although there's, there's probably a bigger belief that he was killed for his gold and thrown in the pit. And the pit was designed to trap bulls, which were wild. So anyway, he died not he died young, and it was sad. Well, and I was reading here there are over 80 species of plant and animal that have Douglas as part of their scientific name. And one of the stories was they were starving. He at that time had two helpers, and they it was late in the evening, and they managed to kill a bird. They were going to have it for dinner. And Douglas got a hold of it and realized it was a bird he'd never seen before. So he, oh, he, he kept it and they weren't allowed to eat it. They were starving. He refused to let them have it. So he was a very, very dedicated individual for sure. Awesome. Well, the next time they caught a bird, they're like, don't show David. <laughs> we keep this one to ourselves. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Well, the next individual is Philip von Siebold. He's also, and you can think of all the plants with Seabold in it, Seboldiana, Seabold. Fascinating man, Bavarian. He worked for, uh, and this was the problem that I had during the lectures, that there were so many different people that different different individuals hired. At, they were hired by different companies, even in the course of their lifetime. But he was hired by the Dutch East Indies Company, which was a company that lasted for a very long time. And he, was, he went to Japan as a physician. And the people that went to Japan were generally put on an island, which is, I'm saying Deshima, D-E-S-H-I-M-A. And it was an island that was built by the Japanese that had great big fence around it and nobody was allowed to leave. It was almost like a prison camp for for foreigners. They didn't want them on the island because they were a closed country. But he, the Dutch East Indies Company was different, and they would allow them to come into Japan. But he did live on Dashima for a while, and then he ended up marrying a Japanese girl, and he was allowed to move to the island Nagasaki. And once he was there, he had a garden, and he was an avid plantsman, but most of his plants came by way of barter. So people would come for a service. For He was a eye doctor, and they would come for services, and he would just barter plants. And uh, he was caught uh, with a map going to a different island for a plant collecting trip. And he was, they ran into problems. I believe maybe the boat was damaged or sunk. But anyway, he was caught red handed with this map and nobody was allowed to have the map. So he was actually, he ended up being kicked out of the country, but he was confined for two years and he was banished from the country and he had to leave his wife and daughter behind, which is really sad. But he ended up going back to, he was from Bavaria, Germany, and he ended up writing some books on the Japanese plants and actually started a nursery. And there's so many plants with Seabold, Seboldiana, Hosta, Sedum, Primula, the, the list goes on. He, he, there were magnolias, there were, there's clematis, Seboldii. So there's a lot. I mean, he's just, I don't know what the number is, but it's, it's very high for what we can say connected with with Philip von Siebold. Well, first of all, all of his pictures, he's a very distinguished looking gentleman, very prominent, strong features. I think of him as kind of Tom Selleck, Tom Selleck, but with a (laughs) a full beard, uh, those big bushy eyebrows. And his official name, when you Google it, is Philip 
Franz Balthazar von Siebold. I mean, what a handle. He's a big, <laughs> big personality. And he and his yeah. whole family was all medical doctors. So he grew up yeah, in a another, very educated right. home. Right, he did. He was very smart and he came up in a very educated home. I remember that, yes. But he, we we then go to the Veaches and the Veaches and the Dutch East Indies Company, we get we we see them quite often, but this is the first introduction to the Veach firm. And the Veach firm was a nursery in England that had just an incredible long history. And this is our first, and he's second generation. The Veach, the, the Veach timeline literally begins with John Veach in 1808, and the nursery didn't close till 1969. I mean, it was just forever. And they hired lots of the explorers. They were singularly responsible for so much plant exploration. And they... Two had seen what was going on with Lewis and Clark. They sent Lobb, William Lobb, and William Lobb was the one that did, wasn't required to keep a journal. So it gets a little fuzzy as to his whole story and all the plants. He, I knew, I know that he explored previously in uh, South America a lot, but this was his first trip to California, Oregon, Washington, and he saw these huge trees and was bringing, sending back seeds and seedlings. So that was the beginning of our beach involvement. And it, the beach involvement goes on and on. And there's a few plants named for the beach firm, but not as many as you think. Apparently, they would let their explorers go ahead and name them for themselves because I found very little Nepenthes vichii, which was Lob, because Lob was, well, that was one of his trips. But the interesting thing, too, is that when Lob got to California, he landed in the middle of the gold rush. So when he came to to port, he said there were ships everywhere and they were all empty. Everybody oh. had abandoned ship and was out trying to find their fortune in gold. We go back to, to poor David Douglas, who could have been a very wealthy man. <laughs> Absolutely. But anyway, so Lob came afterwards. Well, then we jump to the plant explorer with the best last name, Robert Fortune. Right. Um, Robert Fortune was another one that worked for the Royal Horticultural Society, which was then still called the Horticultural Society of London. The lucky thing about Robert Fortune is that he came at a time when we now had the Wardian cases. So before plants were shipped without these greenhouses on wheels, basically, or greenhouses on stilts that would be strapped onto ships and they'd be sent back, you know, on those long journeys. Before that, they would just be packed dry or semi-moist and they would rot or dry up before they got to where they needed to go. And now the Wardian cases were allowing them to send plants uh, live and they would arrive live. They'd even plant seeds in the Wardian cases and by the time they'd get back to wherever they needed to go, they would have sprouted. He was extremely lucky in that. And his big first trip was to China, and he spent a lot of time in China. And he actually, his job was to try to figure out how to grow tea, what the plants were, and how to make them grow. And he he was able to actually uh, put on a costume and basically become a Chinaman. He shaved his head, and he had a braid down the back. And he would travel with a translator. And he actually took a couple people out of the country with him with tea plants he had stolen in order to figure out how to grow them. He brought the people to do it and he brought the plants. So he was the first, you know, the world's first opportunity to try to grow tea outside of China, which is why he had been sent. But the fact that the Wardian case was there is why he was so successful. There are so many plants that you can attribute to Robert Fortune. Um, And I I showed a picture of the Wardian cases, which are absolutely gorgeous. I'd love to own one. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, And, you know, it wasn't just, I mean, just like so many of them, he was sent for tea. And very often they were sent for a food plant of some sort. But they couldn't help but be uh, enamored with the ornamental plants. So he collected Bleeding Heart as well. There's a poem named for him. There's just, you know, if you look up Robert Fortune, you'll see a whole list of things uh, that he's, he's, you can attribute to him. Pinus bongiana is one I showed, and I showed the Camellia Fields, which to me was fascinating because I really didn't know, you know, how they were collecting. And it's Camellia. It's a species of Camellia, how they were. They hand still hand harvest. It's still done. And it's and it is done in the United States now to some degree in South Carolina. 
and in other parts of the, of the world. Hmm. That's incredible. Well, then we go to John Goldveach. So John Goldveach uh, was a young man, and he really had the exploration bug, whereas none of the Veaches has ever been allowed to travel freely or to do that. They would stay home and send the explorers. So Veach managed to talk uh, the firm into letting him go. And he, I believe at the time, was president. He had to step down as president and let his uncle do it uh, so that he could travel. And he went to Japan. Yes, he explored Japan and he explored the tropical islands in the South Seas. He was best known for Boston ivy. That's really kind of the only plant that he was known for because he came out home and and died young at 31 of tuberculosis, which was very sad. He left behind a wife and a, and a young son. Now, was the Boston Ivy the only major discovery of this John Gold Veach? There's very, very little that I really find associated with him, but that is the one plant. And the one, that one plant, the Veach firm was sort of already, I guess, talking to Arnold Arboretum. So the Boston Ivy ended up at the Arnold Arboretum, and I think that's how it got its name. But oh. there's not too many plants that you can associate with him because he just managed to make that one trip. Oh, okay, before he before he tragically died so young. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Well, I know from your earlier talk that this is not the end of the Veach family, but we somehow transition into Thomas Hogg. Yes. The Veach firm continued you know, that we're going to really get into a lot more that the Veaches were doing a little later on. But then we then we moved into Thomas Hogg. And Thomas Hogg worked for the United States Council, and he was sent by the United States to Japan. And his father at the time owned a nursery called the New York Botanical Gardens. And that later became the New York Botanical Gardens. <laughs> so while Thomas Hogg is in Japan, he's sending plants back to the United States, but he's also sending plants back to his father. So we we see that, you know, that people have always had an interest in unusual plants and different plants, you know, that, that I don't think will ever end. You know, even if you're enamored with native and just native plants, you're going to be interested in something new. It's just our nature. So, he, you know, they found a huge market for these new plants, especially coming from uh, Japan and China. So he, you know, we can associate him with quite a few. When his father died, he ended up taking over the business, but Stewardia pseudocamellia is one, Styrax japonica, Styrax sobacea, uh, Cercidophyllum japonica. These are just a few that he collected. And he was not allowed to travel much. He collected these mostly in gardens, you know, rather than in the wild. There's the hosta, the old-fashioned hosta that I yes. recall Thomas Hogg, yeah. He was at another, he was again at a good time. Plants were able to be sent back uh, in in good health, and then he sort of had these dual places to send them, and it was it behooved him to send them to his father and to to send them to that nursery for them to be the first to have these exotic plants from from Japan. Well, then we go back to the Beach family, and this time it's James Herbert Beach. Yes, so we're still we're still sticking with the Beaches, and this ends up being the son of John Gold Beach. So this is the son of the of the man that died at the age of 31. He also has the bug, like his father, and he wanted to travel too. And he was allowed to travel once to Japan. And the interesting thing is Charles Sargent, Arnold Arboretum, happened to be there at the same time. I, I don't believe that Charles Sargent traveled that much. So that was just wonderful that they the two of them met. They had long discussions about Arnold Arboretum versus of each firm, what they could do for each other, the fact that they were going to stay in touch. Uh, they wanted to be able to sort of pay for these excursions jointly so they would be able to jointly get the return of, of plants and seeds. The sergeant is 51 at the time, and they at that time he collected the seed for the sergeant's crab apple in Japan while he was there. But James Herbert, you know, met with Sergeant. They became friends, and that began another whole period of a, sort of a joint a sponsorship by these two organizations. Well, then we come to one of your favorite people, one of your favorite plant explorers, Augustine Henry. Yes. 
And Augustine Henry, I find to be absolutely fascinating. And I keep saying that, but really they all are. <laughs> I know, I, I can't, uh, each one of them is just gives me a soft spot in my heart about thinking of what they had to live through. But Augustine Henry was, was hired by, he was an Irishman, and he was hired by the Imperial Chinese Maritime Customs Service as a medical officer. And he was sent into China, and he was way, way into China. He was a thousand miles in from the ocean. Um, and he was put at this post, and he was sort of watching as, as boats would go by. He would, he was working as a customs agent of some sort. And he saw that all these plants were coming by, and he, he sort of self-taught himself. He became interested in horticulture and self-taught. But he was not allowed to leave his post. So what he would do is he would send these young Chinamen that he would train up into the, the hillsides around him and tell them what to collect, and they would bring it back to him. And then he, all on his own, was sending plants to you, to Arnold Arboretum, to the Royal Horticulture Society, and telling them all with these letters, don't you see what you're not doing? You're not here collecting these plants. And that was pretty profound because, you know, it opened up the eyes of, of all of them. And they knew that, that this part of the world was open and rife for for exploration. And then he himself has many plants that are named after him. Clematis Henry I, Lilium Henry I. There's quite a number, but it was the dove tree that did the trick. The dove tree, he sent specimens of the dove tree to the beach farm. And we now it's being run by Sir Harry James Beach. Sir Harry James Beach had decided that plant exploration was over. That China had been he'd been told that China had been explored because he'd had one man go there and get beat and robbed and came back and he was just so angry about the whole experience that he told him there's nothing left to be found in China. Oh, interesting. Right. But here comes the dove tree. So the dove tree, he sees the specimen and he has to have it. Augustine Henry is telling him, you know, this is where it is. So he decides to hire a young man uh, from Q. He hires Henry Wilson. It's decided that Henry Wilson is the man for the job. And Henry Wilson is not only taught by the beach firm on how to travel. He was trained, but he was being taught how to travel safely in China. He was being taught on how to dry or bury him specimens on everything that would be involved in collecting these plants. He went by ship to Arnold Arboretum, and there he was taught by Charles Sargent and his team what they wanted. You know, we need things that are hardy for Boston. We need things that are hardy for this zone. And it took him two years to get to the site of Augustine, just to the camp where Augustine Henry was, and to begin the real trek to find the dove tree. And you remember all this, right? Or do you, I do. do you know the dove tree? Never. I've never seen a dove tree. But I was also going to tell you that I was reading that Ernest Henry Wilson's nickname was Chinese. Chinese Wilson. Yes, yeah. exactly. Chinese Wilson. And so the year that I had the catalog that I did for my nursery with men in horticulture, I had read all these stories and I knew I needed to sell the dove tree. If I didn't sell the dove tree, then what was the point exactly? So. <laughs> I ended up having to find, which is no easy feat, and I did finally find it uh, and offered it for sale that year. And the cool thing was that the trees that I sold, I was in someone's garden. It was, we calculated, it was eight years later, and her dove tree was blooming. And they normally, it takes them much longer to bloom than eight years. So the stock that I got was apparently really, really good stock. I was really happy about that. But what ended up happening, so here comes Henry Wilson to meet Augustine Henry. He finally gets there two years later, and Augustine Henry basically says to him, he scribbles a, a map, which I showed the map, and it's equivalent to the size of the state of New York with this little note of here, this is where it is. <laughs> he says, aren't you going to come with me and show me? <laughs> and Augustine Henry is like, I have been here 18 years, and I can't wait to get out. <laughs> He couldn't wait. He couldn't do it. He was not doing it. He was really, he felt relieved. And if you go back through the you know, stories, you will understand that Arnold Arboretum just pestered Augustine Hunter's death to be the person that, that, that 
that, that he would work for them. And he was always, Charles Sargent was always sending him letters saying, you know, money's no object. We want you to work for us, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, no, don't want to do it. And I hope you find somebody. I mean, actually, you can see a copy of one of the letters that he ended with, you know, I hope you can find someone. As in other words, don't ask me anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> he was relieved when they found Henry Wilson. And Henry Wilson travels, and I can't remember how much longer it was for him to to get to the site, finally, he had to go through different small villages. He had to ask the villagers if they knew of this tree. He knew the name of the tree in Chinese. And finally, he gets to the site of the tree that Augustine Henry had found, and he finds that it's been cut down and made into a home. Oh. <laughs> so, and, you know, there was no, no, nobody knew of any others. He didn't know if he'd find any, you know, this is how it all starts. And you can actually read you can find his journal page for that day where he writes, you know, just what a horrible day this is. I can't believe I've, you know, can imagine traveling for two years only to find that what you've been searching for is, is not there, uh-huh. but he did end up finding more. And it was, it was just a fascinating little story. And of course the, the beach firm was very happy to get their dove tree. Um, but what happened was that after all of that, uh, Charles Sargent decided and what had happened when, Henry Wilson had gone to see Charles Sargent on that little training trip before he was headed to China was that they had hit it off as just absolutely best, best friends. And I remember saying to, to the guard bloggers that if we had Facebook, they would be Facebook friends immediately <laughs> because they just hit it off so well. And anyway, they, Charles Sargent came back and asked Henry Wilson if he wouldn't work for the Arnold Arboretum. And Henry Wilson at that point I think he'd gone to China for the Veach firm three times. I could be wrong, but his wife at that point didn't want him to travel anymore. He was kind of undecided, and Charles Sargent just kept telling him, you know, not only is money no object, but one of his requests was, if I finish with it, with another trip, will you give me full-time employment and a home and all this for my family? And so, of course, he said yes. And then the last thing that was was required was that Henry Wilson wanted to take the first photographs that we would literally we would see of Japan and China. So he would he asked and specifically China, he asked that he have enough people to manage the glass plates for a Sanderson camera, which would have these 18 inch plates for negatives, glass plates. So, you know, again, and he bought that in England before he came over to Arnold Arboretum, and, and then they trained him on what they were looking for, and he went with, and I, I seem to recall that the cost of that first expedition, and this is in something like 1903, was $13,000, which would equate to a whole lot of money now. Yes. But we did start to see these absolutely incredible, and he had to learn photography, you're talking about negatives. You don't know if you did, did it justice, if you got it right, if you had your aperture and shutter speed and all that right. So he, you know, he, he taught himself how to use the camera and he, he wrote in his journal at one point or in a letter to Charles Sargent, I've done everything I can to make sure that these negatives are exposed well. And if I failed, I failed because he just had done everything he could. But I, you know, I started to show in the presentation some of the photographs, and the and the beautiful thing is you can go to Arnold Arboretum, and you can access these files. They've been digitized, and I know just for Ernest Henry Wilson, there's almost three thousand images that you can look at. Hmm. It's just absolutely incredible. Well, and one of the most beautiful images of your presentation shows Wilson with Sargent, and they're standing in front of a beautiful tree in bloom. Well, and I'm thinking it might be a crab apple. Sargent's crab apple. Oh, it might be. Oh, there you go. I mean, I don't know. And you can see it's hand colored. Yes. You know, the colors are a bit odd. But Henry Wilson, as, as a plant explorer, as a plantsman, just his journals, his notes. I showed one of the charts that illustrate, it's called the chart illustrating zones of vegetation. And he talks about, or he shows how the altitude, at what altitude you could expect to find what plants. So he, he was ready to be able to 
you know, if you if you requested plants that would be hardy to zone five, he he would one know where to go more or less, and he would know more or less what he would find because he had done this chart and it it starts out at you know so many feet, cool, it becomes cool temperate zone, and then you get mixed deciduous trees. He did this entire sort of uh, triangle that shows it up to the snow line, the, uh, the the alpine zone, the subalpine zone, and what kind of plants would occupy that space. I mean, you just see that he was just brilliant in his knowledge for traveling as much as he did and, and figuring out all these things. Again, you know, you go back to how much reference material do you have to have to know what kind of plant you're looking at, how to key it out. Yeah, the chart is really cool. He lists the zone, the elevation, and then the plants that he would find at each of those elevations. Right. You know, he knew who, how to, to look for what people needed. And, you know, I suspect, and I know for a fact, that the Arnold Arboretum, just the plants that Henry Wilson was sending back, was enough to create an entire branch of the Arnold Arboretum. Because now they needed, just to work with the plants he was sending back, they had a botanical illustrator. They had a dendrologist, so this was the man that would study all this tree tree samples, you know, dried specimens that were sending back. So it, it's not that he absolutely had to know. They had people that would research that when he got back, but it, it created work for four other people to specialize just in the plants that he was sending back with his herbarium specimens. And, and the other thing is that, you know, with his travels, we know this from his photographs, they were now traveling with glass plates and this big camera with big tripod, but they were also ready to, they had to take the specialized papers. They had to take the, the, uh, the wooden supports to press the plants. So they had to have all this pressing material. They had to have their food. Um, the, you know, I talked about how they were traversing such dangerous mountains in China that they would carry a gong. And the gong was so that on these narrow trails as they're crossing over a mountain, if they heard or suspected that another group was coming, they would continue to gong or, so that they would know they were coming so that they could stop in a wide space rather than meet on some ledge that was too oh. narrow for two groups to pass. Which is why so I cannot was, be a plant hunter. <laughs> right. And, and and I think that a lot of us can say that because oh. these were, and he was traveling when the country was in turmoil. You know, he there were a lot of times he traveled and people said, go back, this is too dangerous, you're crazy man to do this. And a lot of the explorers would write these things in their journals. And there were, you know, there were some that did not make it back. So it was, oh, it was so dangerous. But anyway, he Wilson did end up settling and he ended up becoming the director of the Arnold Arboretum. And then, you know, I went through and I showed some of the pictures of the trees. Oh, my gosh. You know, the cryptomerias that he was finding, um, the ginkgos that he was finding, uh, the way that the, that the locals would travel with the tea stacked, you know, on their back that would oh, I just bundles of tea that how they managed to, to do that. You know, the strength that they had to have to carry those weights, traverse those mountains. There was one photograph of the herbarium specimens they were about to be shipped back. And it looks like there's probably, I don't know, two or three hundred of these bundles that look like canvas wrap that are, you know, going back to Arnold Arboretum to be identified and you know, recorded. Then he loved to take pictures of bridges because he, like so many others, their easiest way of travel was over water. So they would get in these boats and they would go down these rivers. But you read from, even from David Douglas, early on with David Douglas, that what would happen was they would run into rapids or something and they their boat would capsize and they would lose everything. They would lose their journals. They would learn, lose their herbarium specimens. They would lose all the stuff that they had worked for who knows how long to do. So they loved bridges. So you see, it seems like he took a picture of every bridge that he came to because he was so grateful that there was a bridge they could cross instead of after. Have actually having in the Yangtze River is how they traveled most of the time to get deep into China. These are rope bridges, too. So, I mean, I these know. are like Indiana Jones bridges. So, yeah. I know he was yeah. thrilled to cross this thing, but I'm looking at it going, I can't believe it. I mean, it looks treacherous. Right. Right. But they would rather do that. <laughs> 
Then go down in the water. And, I, you know, I mean, you, you can read lots and lots about their, their travels down the waterways because there were times a year that there were parts of the Yangtze that they couldn't safely travel. It was just too dangerous. But Henry I, you know, he was just singularly responsible for just so, so many plants. Um, yeah. It just goes on and on and on. And, you know, a lot of them that I show don't have his name associated with them because he may have found them for the second time. But but maybe the first time they sailed or the first time whoever recorded them, whatever plant explorer, which you always, you know, we fall back to who was the original uh, person that found this plant. It, Clematis Armandii, you know, is named by Armand, but that was one that he found and redistributed and Acer Grisium and Cornus Cusa, just so many plants that he was thinking. And he was just a brilliant, brilliant individual. Just for everything you read, he was he was kind and, and he traveled with dogs and it's just amazing, amazing individual. Thank goodness we have these pictures to show the tremendous lengths he went to and just the overall experience. It's incredible. Yes. Well, next up is Frank Nicholas Meyer. Right. Right. So, so we went to Frank Nicholas Meyer, and Meyer was, was, um, he was a person that a lot of times you'll read about him. It was, he loved to walk. He would walk for hundreds of miles. One, one website says he was a hobo at heart. He started working at a nursery as a young man, but he was mostly self taught. And he worked, he ended up working for, he did travel for Sergeant and Ar- Arnold Arboretum, but he, he ended up working for USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. And he was looking for food crops, but he would also find ornamental crops. And he did indeed walk and walk and walk. When he was working for USDA, the interesting thing is he had met with Sergeant. He'd been to Arnold Arboretum. Uh, Henry Wilson was still there. And they were a little bit, it seems, at odds with each other because they were both sort of collecting in the same areas of the world. But he was really working more for the Department of Agriculture than he was for Sergeant. And he he ended up, when he would collect plants, he wanted to see them go to Sergeant because he thought that they would t- be taken better care of than they would by the Department of Agriculture, which oh, is sort of interesting. That's and, very interesting. And, you, you know, that, that was a big issue when I went to the Longwood Talks about these explorers that would go out and find all these plants and risk their lives, and then plants would not be handled well on the other end. And that was why, you know, they had that whole team that worked behind Henry Wilson and what he was bringing back so that it was all successful. Because otherwise, you know, what was the reason to send you off and just get these plants and then have them not, not be, not be propagated, not be distributed. So that was, a, that was something that even Frank Meyer had realized at the time. But he was originally sent because the fire blight had hit the pear trees in the West. And he was trying to find pear trees that were resistant to the fire blight. So he ended up with a calorie pear. And the calorie pear, over time, and a cultivar of it was the Bradford pear. So he didn't bring back the Bradford pear, but the plant that he brought back ended up being responsible for it because it ended up being a cultivar. The Bradford pear ended up being cultivar of that. So there's a long story with that. He ended up being found. He he died. I don't have his age, and he wasn't old, but he ended up, they found him uh, drowned in the Yangtze River in China. Nobody knows what happened. Nobody has any idea why, why you know, what happened prior to that. So that was sort of a sad story, but he was a wonderful, interesting individual. And, you know, as far as plants go, you can think of... Um, Asparagus myri. So he's already looking for, at asparagus, a food crop, but he finds an ornamental form in asparagus myri. So that was one. The Meyer lemon. The Meyer lemon, right? Most of what he was after was was more on for food crops. Then at this point, uh, we go back to Charles Sargent, and we find that Henry Wilson isn't going to be doing any more traveling, or at least he's sort of let on. And I think they had a daughter now. His wife, you know said, no more traveling for you. You're staying home. <laughs> That's right. Well, this must be where they hire William Perdome. Yes, but uh, William Perdome didn't turn out to uh, to be anything like what Henry Wilson had been. So they begged Henry Wilson to, to, uh, to do this again, to go make the trip. 
uh, to China, and he finally gave in. And it, it was mostly because he, there were things that were nagging at him that he hadn't finished, that he hadn't accomplished. And it was more the herbaceous or perennial stuff. Uh, Mechanopsis was one. Some of the lilies was another. So he decided that he would do it, and he went on yet another. And he would always hire the same team of Sherpas. So you see repeatedly with his photographs, which we're so lucky to be able to do, the same group of individuals that would travel with him and collect with him. And they learned to dry the herbarium specimens and they learned to work with, with him. I mean, it was, again, it was, a, there was this whole team in China. There was this whole team at Boston, the Arnold Arboretum, but he would repeatedly go back to them and rehire them and travel with them. And you see, you see them over the years, you see the same faces, but you see them age a bit, which is really, really cool that he was he had these same people that he could he could collect when he got back, which I'm sure took a lot of the burden off of the whole process of finding and retraining people to be able to do this. So he went back for Lily. He had learned from the Veach firm the first time, and I mentioned this Lilium Regale, when he collected, he collected eighteen thousand bulbs and he sent them back. And the way that you're supposed to pack them for shipping so this is not something that would go in a wardian case. It's something that would be sent in a crate is they would take the bulb, they would roll it around in mud, and then they would pack it in charcoal. But what he had done with the 18,000 Lilium regales that he had sent before was that he would he would roll them in the clay, but he, he didn't do this charcoal. And when they got to the Arnold Arboretum of the 18,000, more than 17,000 of them had rocked. Oh, my gosh. He had learned, you know, through the beach firm. So now he knew he had to go back to the original way of doing it. And he did because he was there three three years that time. He, he already got word back in, in a letter, I'm sure, from Charles Sargent that he had sort of failed at that attempt. So he did it again. But this time he went and he was after other lilies. And there happened to be a, a rock a landslide down one of the mountains and it hit him and knocked him down the mountain and it broke his leg, I believe, in two places. And here they are, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. So his Sherpas took the tripod for the camera that he was still traveling with and they rigged it up as a splint for his leg and put him on a on a makeshift gurney and they started on this trip to try to find his hospital. And I think they knew where they were going, but it took them something like two or three days to get there running, you know, the whole time with him. And when they got there, they said, the doctor said right off, you know, this is infected. This is really bad. We're going to have to remove the leg. And he was, no, please don't, you know, let me keep my leg. Don't move it. And so they kept it and they worked with him. And he, it was a long, long healing period for him in this little remote hospital in China. But what happened was that the guys that he'd been traveling with, because he trained and worked with them for so long before they knew what to do. So they actually finished, you know, everything that he went to do and sent the things back to the Arnold Arboretum safely. Huh. And he, from then on, had a limp on that leg, which they called them, his, he called his lily limp. Oh, his lily limp. His lily limp from that trip. Which did end up being his last one. That was his last trip. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) It was his last trip. And I showed pictures of the lilies, you know, the way they wrap them in mud. And I showed, actually, there's, there's a photograph of the hospital that he was, that he stayed in during that period. Uh, but here it is, the same guys are all just working with, with the lilies, shows the crates that they sent them in. And then I showed the team back at back at Arnold, the team that was working with, with him, which, like I said, it had a botanical illustrator. It had the dendrologist. Um, I actually have a photograph in my, in my catalog that talks about what each one did. And there was the dendrologist. There was the botanist. So the botanist, that, so there was the botanist that would just, I guess he would break it down and then the dendrologist would get the tree samples. He would get all the others. And then there was the botanical illustrator. So there was quite, quite a team uh, of people back, back at Arnold that was working with all of the things to make it successful with what he was exploring. And he did t- make a trip for 
uh, just for not really necessarily planned exploration, but just to take his family and went to Japan. So there's some pictures. He, he continued with his photography. So you see pictures of there's a nursery in Japan that I showed. And I went on to show some of the people that he worked with as far as, you know, different different places in China and different different individuals that he worked with and would collectively um, uh, build build relationships with and then and, and maybe even some of these were the Sherpas that he had. But I showed different there's wonderful different photographs. I, I did show the one with the with the group of reformed headhunters, which I couldn't help but wonder what that meant. And uh they, they really were headhunters. They yes. really were. They yeah, they were actual headhunters, like Gilligan's Island headhunters. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting there. Sur- is that yeah. him? Or- no, that's Wilson sitting with and all Wilson, of these. Yeah. yeah, with all of the headhunters. <laughs> but you know the, why? Why we know all this, which is another point to the journals and keeping the journals. Not only did he keep a journal for his day to day activities, but with every one of his digital slot, I mean his negatives that were on glass, he would scratch a number on them. That's how you know they're his, and then it would refer back to. He would write about it in a, in a, I guess he kept a separate journal just for his photographs. And so they have all of that information about what these photographs are about. So when it talks about he's with reformed headhunters, otherwise, how would they know? It just looks like another group of people. Yes. Kudos to him for the fact that he would record and keep it and be so organized about everything that he did. I showed a picture of a ginkgo, which is... 19 feet, 6 inches round, yes. like 3 feet up. I showed it. The cryptom areas were just absolutely, the photographs of the cryptom areas are just everywhere. The poppies growing, you know, the poppy trade was, was happening. So the poppies, these are poppies growing along the Yangtze River in black and white. Um, I showed a picture of just this swath, this beautiful swath. It's all black and white, but you can imagine a Japanese iris blooming down in a sort of a wet place and and then an alley of cryptom areas with a road in the middle, uh, with Syria being trained on pergolas, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And then one of the last, if not the last, uh, is Joseph Rock. And Joseph Rock uh, ended up working for Arnold Arboretum as well. And Joseph Rock already, and he was self-trained himself, but he was a very, very intelligent human being. He actually taught at a college in Hawaii. He did a lot of his research work, botanically speaking, in Hawaii. But the Arnold Arboretum wanted to hire him, and they did. And this is getting towards the end of Charles Sargent's time. Charles Sargent is now an older man, but they hired Joseph Rock to go back to China, but they want him to go further into China, more into Tibet and to areas that are, you know, further in a lot of of upheaval in the country, um, very, very cold places, um, but they want him to go and collect for them. And he does, and I showed actually a photo, um, yes, a photograph of a letter that was written um, where where Charles Sargent asked him to uh, to travel for them. Joseph probably is best known for the peony rockii, but there are also a lot of plants, and some of them Hawaiian or tropical and then cold hardy like like these when he's working for Arnold Arboretum. Huh. He he also worked for Harvard and he was he, he traveled with a, with some hunters. They were they were collecting the birds and they were they were um basically taxiderming the birds and sending them back to Arnold. These were birds that hadn't been seen before. And he did such a good job at that. They say that those birds are still preserved as well as the day that he um they treated them. I mean, they sent them back. They all, they're all still there. So there's That's some awesome. photographs of, of his very specialized hunters with some of these birds that we hadn't again seen before that were sent back specimens. And then, yes, I showed the letter. It was written by Joseph Rock to Sergeant asking that, you know, he please uh, keep him informed. He would love to do the job and go to China for him. But the interesting thing about Joseph Rock, he, he seemed to be very flamboyant, and he traveled with an Abercrombie and Fitch canvas bathtub. <laughs> he also traveled with a full set of silverware, and his his guys that would work for him, he would train them, but he also had them wear uniforms, which is interesting, because you usually see just kind of a ragmuffin group of, of, of uh, 
you know, local people that would travel with these plant explorers, but he would pose with them. Uh, you can also go to Arnold Arbery site and you can put in, in the search for the images, you can put in Joseph Rock and you'll find, you know, not near as many as Ernest Henry Wilson, but you'll find a lot of these wonderful old. And I, I don't know what kind of camera he traveled with, but there are certainly are plenty of photographs and he was the selfie king, I would say. It's, he, he wasn't doing selfies, but he loved to have his photograph taken of himself in different situations or places. Um, a fascinating individual and very, very, very intelligent. And some beautiful photographs of people of, of Tibet that we had not seen before. Um, that I just find absolutely fascinating. You can tell it's very cold. They have, you know, these incredibly layered fur and leather coats. And, you know, I still, I just can't get over how long their sleeves are. Yeah. You know, it's just, I, I don't, I just, I just guess that was so you could keep your hands warm. Nope. Awesome. But I, there were a lot of beautiful photographs and you can tell that they would, you know, take a while to process because you'll see movement in faces if faces turned. You know, that whole standing still for that length of time to get the photograph taken. Um, you you see a few that are just absolutely crystal clear because people would do it. So it's just a beautiful thing. And then the interesting thing is that you, know, you can, through social media, which is so beautiful, be it um, Twitter or Instagram, you can just hashtag... Ernest Henry Wilson or hashtag Joseph Rock. And there's people that are trying to retrace, you know, their, their journeys and then posing and taking pictures and, and with the plants, there's, there's dove trees, people, will, you know, hashtag Ernest Henry Wilson for that, which is just wonderful. And I, I like to think that, think that they would really, really appreciate that. Considering, well, Yeah, absolutely. And it's so picturesque. And if you look up those hashtags, hashtag Joseph Rock or hashtag Ernest Henry Wilson, there's also a website that just says in the footsteps of Joseph Rock. And it shows a number of pictures then and now. And these are extremely remote and rugged places still to this day. So when you see right. these pictures... It feels like you're going back in time, even though there are modern day pictures. I know, and I agree. I mean, I've looked at them myself, and I, I completely agree. And and I wanted to just say that that Joseph Rock ended up having to curtail his trip and come home because Charles Sargent passed away while he was there, and so he came back. And Ernest Henry Wilson ended up being the director of Arnold Arboretum, and and. Uh, you know, he as as he, as in all things, he did a, a wonderful job. And Ernest Henry Wilson ended up dying in a car accident with his wife. They were driving, and they think that they hit uh, some wet leaves on the side of the road and lost control of their car, and and were both killed. And one thing you hear as an association with Ernest Henry Wilson is he lived by the tree and he died by the tree, which is very sad. But um, you know, I just, I, you know, sometimes people will say, well, what, what would you do if you could go back in history or time and you could meet a certain person? And I think Ernest Henry Wilson would be most definitely one I, I would just, just love to have been able to meet. It's staggering to think of all the places they went and how much they accomplished with the resources that they had. And I just chose a few. I just chose a few because I had books that would help me understand them. And, uh, you know, I look around and I, uh, you know, you can go an entirely different direction with plant exploration and learn of an entirely different set of people. I just remember from when I first was interested that, that this was sort of the route. And you wonder why China and Japan were so important, but you'll read time and time again that their, their success at finding different plants and not just different plants there more more species than anywhere else but that those were the plants that became worthy plants for us in our gardens but at the same time they so many of them became our some of our worst you know so you know we understand if you if you study geography and the history of the world and you know why it is that we have these disjunct species that are so like our own in, in China and Japan, um, 
it's because we were at one point one continent, but this is, you know, where, where we get kudzu vine from, where we get Japanese honeysuckle vine. So, you know, that's, it's also some of our, our very worst plants, but some of our best, if, you know, if you don't mind having foreign plants in your garden. Well, and I was reading, as you were talking about one of these guys, one of the early explorers, he had gone, I think, with Sargent to Australia thinking, oh, I'll, I'll explore Australia. And he left. He's like, no one will help me here. So when they were in China and they're showing these pictures of the people there that would help them, you know, the pictures of these teams that they put together, they had like a dozen people that would help them carry things and help them set up camp. Right. You know, right. They had, they had to know that it would be worth it. I mean, it cost, it was a lot of money to sponsor this, but you know, the next year in my journey through having the plant farm and writing the catalogs, I did the men in horticulture, and then the next year I did women in horticulture. That was my plan. But the women in horticulture ended up being nothing like the men in horticulture because we ended up with a lot of botanical illustrators, and they were, you know, so often it, nobody knew they wouldn't sign their works and anything. But one of them, one of them was I, I covered Gertrude Jekyll, and I covered Ellen Wilmot, and Ellen Wilmot was one that was a wealthy wealthy gardener that she she also you would have sponsorship from individuals wealthy sponsorships from individuals like her that would pay to get a seed lot you know and you would have whole organizations do that so that was one of the other ways that they would make money you know i read once where the the um primrose society of alaska wanted the super cold hardy primula and so they were sending in money for seed lots for these explorers that were going, you know, up to certain uh, latitudes higher where they were able to find, you know, really cold. And they would get the seed pack and it would just be numbered. You know, they wouldn't even know. <laughs> They'd have to grow it and, and the number would correlate to something. But there's, there's still, as far as I know, there's still, this still goes on where you have organizations and individuals that pay for seed lots. There's still plant exploration today. Mm-hmm. But it was just, you know, it's a different time. It was just, it was just such a struggle for them. And to me, I'm still always amazed that they could now, you know, you could almost snap a picture of a plant <laughs> and have a Google map associated with it and have somebody tell you what it is. Then they had to research other people's documents and letters and, you know, all everything from writing it down to, to also photographing these scenes. It's just amazing to me, the whole process. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, Karen, I can't thank you enough for sharing your presentation with us. This was just absolutely tremendous. I thank, know thank that you, you for letting me. And I know that you enjoy giving this presentation. This is a highlight for you. You truly love this stuff. I do. And the feedback I get afterwards is always very interesting. I had a lot of feedback after I gave it there that night for the group because I had one gentleman came up to me and they had met Thomas Hogg's son. They were from New York. So they knew that whole story. I had a couple people come up to me that just had different takes on where they've been or how they knew about plant exploration and, or I, I can honestly say I've never seen a Wardian case. There was a lot of interest in the Wardian cases and that, you know, I, I suspect there's some around, but I would love to see a Wardian case. And the story behind the Wardian case, the simplicity of what it was and how it was even Nathaniel Ward figured out, you know, how to make it. It seems so logical and simple now, but there's a there's a lot of people interested in this and it sort of spikes a lot of interest because these individuals had to have so many interests that, you know, we in gardening, you know, we end up learning about we if we're watching and paying attention we we figure out all these different insects that come at different times of year. You know, I have my night garden out here and I have so many different things come at night. And I want to know who all the moths are and, you know, I've got to leave the caterpillars so that they become the moths. So as gardeners, it's just, it's just not just plants. Yeah. For so many people, it may start out as gardening and then this whole other world opens up to them. So whether they're looking into insects or they're looking into other aspects of nature, mushrooms or or what have you, it, it ends up taking you places and getting you to learn about things that 
you never would have imagined. And I, I feel like this whole shift towards the pollinator garden is starting to open doorways into horticulture. It's the back door. And it's young people. And I love the fact that the young people are being first attracted to the plight of the monarch, but then they learn about the Asclepius and the relationship. And it's like they're coming in through the back door instead of through the front door. And I, I just, I think this is such a good thing for our young people and for them to get into horticulture. People are always talking about how do we appeal to millennials? How do we appeal to millennials? And I think you just keep it simple and you share stories. You share the fascinating history of plants, plant explorers, all kinds of things. That's what hooks uh, kids these days because they're used to processing so much information. They don't just want to see the plant and hear the name of the plant, they need to know some interesting facts about the plant as well. That's how you endear the whole world of gardening into their hearts. That's how you get them hooked. Yeah, well, we're all trying. We're all trying very hard because we need young people in horticulture, I think. Absolutely. How can people find you? If people wanted to get a hold of you, you do have a blog so they can continue to read all of the wonderful blog posts that you still create to this day. How do they find your blog? How do they get a hold of you if they'd like you to come and speak at their garden club? So I, the blog is through TypePad. So it's karenrexroad.typepad.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm certainly on Facebook, all just with my name. With Instagram, I try to take photographs that I don't share to Facebook. I try to make that different. And my blog is mostly gardening, but it's also about, I have an art studio at home. It's about my art, but it's also about, I have guinea fowl, and I've written a lot about raising guinea fowl, which is very challenging. Um, I have one chicken left, but we used to have a lot of chickens. So, you know, I write just about all the different things. I have three grandchildren, so it's just the blog is a mix of everything, but it is mostly gardening. So, you know, if they go there, they can find me. My contacts are all through all those different um, sites, so they can always reach me that way. And I I do lecture a lot. Um, I travel quite a bit to... uh lecture on many, many topics. I lecture through the nursery I work at. I lecture through some of the local botanical gardens, Green Spring, and and even um, I'm traveling to Richmond for the Garden Club of Virginia to do a fall lecture. So I do that quite a bit, and I, I enjoy that. I can do it on many topics, but I do love this one very, very much. Well, and as long as I have you on the phone, I might as well have you highlight a few of the other subject areas that you speak on. I have probably three lectures that I really enjoy. Uh, one of them is is based on a theory that's German called the Grimes Triangle, and it's where you break perennials into three categories. And it's 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 a German idea concept, and it's it's readily known in Germany, but it's it's not readily known here in the United States. But you break your perennials into the three categories, which are pioneers competitors and stress tolerators. And by understanding what their sort of their modus operandi are in the garden, you know how to use them, you know how to place them together. So that I remember when I first learned about that, that was just an absolute epiphany. And I first learned about it in uh, Pete Udolph's book, um, Planting in Time and Space. And I just, it's a thread that ran throughout the entire book. And I just absolutely loved the, the concept um, the one I'm giving it for the Garden Club of Virginia this fall is they asked me to speak to the Garden Club of Virginia, and I knew that there was a lot of floral um, sort of arranging that went on with the group. So they asked me what the topic would be, and I said it would. Uh, I decided to do it the uncommon cut, as in the uncommon cut flower. So I started the March first, the first first week I started, and I've done one to two flower arrangements ever since, every single week. One to two. Oh, my goodness. So by the time I do it, I I feel like I have I will have pretty much con- conquered that topic, <laughs> and I will have some real eye opening uh, ideas for them. And some of those I have blogged about uh, some of the plants. I for Virginia Tech uh, years ago, 
this was really, I say to this day, it's a highlight of my life. I was able to lecture with Amy Stewart and Paula Gross on when when Amy Stewart had come out with the book, The Wicked Bugs and the Wicked Plants series, or not series, it's two single books. Um, they asked me to lecture with them, and it was basically going to be one of those sort of spooky kind of lectures. It was called The Wicked Plant symposium. <laughs> they asked me what I wanted to lecture on, and I said the dark side, just sort of spouting off a name. But I ended up doing one on these crazy aspects of gardening, which included the black uh, garden, which I had done for years and years and years. I'm finally not doing it anymore, but the black garden and uh, doing terrariums with a twist, doing miniature gardens that were certainly not fairy gardens at all. I built one with a miniature cemetery and oh. uh, a crypt in it, and uh, I put fog in it, and it was just absolutely fabulous. So those are those are kind of my favorite. Wow. Yeah, and now you can show these amazing images, too, like you were saying from the Arnold Arboretum. Every time I do this lecture, I feel like I want to change up some of the images, so I'll go back, and I, I recall that I had stopped in Henry Wilson's archive digital files at number 800. <laughs> oh, so I can go back and start at 801 just to see what I haven't seen because I have never made it through all of them. There's so many. Wow. Well, Karen, if people want to find you, how do they get a hold of you? How do they email you? What's the best they can way? E- they can email me at my email address, which is Karen at Windy Hill, like the wind, Karen at windyhill.net. Uh, my nursery was Windy Hill Plant Farm, so I kept that address. Uh, my last name is Rex Road, R-E-X-R-O-D-E, if they're looking for me on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. And that's also how you would spell it if you were going to the blog site is is Karen, R-E-X-R-O-D-E, Rex Road, dot typepad, dot com. And those are all, you know, those are all good, but emails are fine. Love it. Well, thank you so much again for sharing all the stories of these wonderful plant hunters, a topic that's near and dear to your heart. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. Well, that's it for our show today featuring Karen Rexroad and her fascinating look at plant explorers. If your curiosity was piqued by Karen's talk as mine was, head on over to Amazon and get those wonderful resources that Karen mentioned at the top of her presentation. First up is the book by Tyler Whittle called The Plant Hunters, Tales of the Botanist Explorers Who Enriched Our Gardens. I love that subtitle too. So just look for The Plant Hunters on Amazon, I was able to get my copy for $6. There's plenty of those around. The next resource Karen talked about was called Plant Exploration for Longwood Gardens, and this one's by Tomas Anisko. Longwood Gardens of Kennett Square, Pennsylvania enjoys a long and distinguished tradition of plant exploration and introduction dating back to the foundation of its arboretum in 1798. This is a great resource. I found it on Amazon for about $18. Finally, there's a book by Stephen Spongberg, and it's called A Reunion of Trees, The Discovery of Exotic Plants and Their Introduction into North American and European Landscapes. I tracked this one down on Amazon for $10. And here's what it said about this book in the description. Stephen Spongberg's vividly written and lavishly illustrated travel story of trees and shrubs tells of the intrepid explorers who journeyed to the far corners of the globe and brought back to Europe and North America a wealth of exotic plant species. So there you go. For less than $50, you can get all three of these fantastic resources on Amazon. And that will get you started on your own exploration, your own journey of discovery, learning about the plant explorers. In closing, if you enjoyed Karen's presentation, go ahead and share this episode on social media and use the hashtag Karen Rex Road. I'd love it if gardeners everywhere had a chance to listen to Karen. She's a gem of horticultural insight and wisdom. Well, I'm so thankful to my team at Podfly Productions. 
I want to thank my editor, Eric Begay, my copywriter, Ein Kadina, and my project manager, David Gregerson. Just a reminder that I'll have all of the generous information that Karen shared on the show today over at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And then just click on podcast and you'll see the podcast page pop up with all of the show notes and every single episode listed right there for you. While you're over at my website, you can also click to join the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. And you can also check out my masterminds. Just click on the tab, work with me. And if you're interested, that opportunity will pop up and you can schedule time on my calendar to talk more about it. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the listeners from the Facebook group that make up my listener advisory board. Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois. She works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm and is one of the finest companies in horticultural service. And Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants. And she was featured back in episode 553 where we talked all about native plants, and I certainly hope you're incorporating more natives into your landscape this year. Well, if you get a chance to spend some time in your own garden this week, I'm sure as you're walking around, you'll recognize some of the plants that were mentioned in this episode that we can thank the plant explorers for. And if you're like me, you'll begin to look at them with renewed appreciation and gratitude. So now as I go through my garden, I say things like, thank you, John Tradescant. Thank you, John and William Bartram. Thank you, David Douglas and the very distinguished looking Philip von Siebold. Thanks to the entire Veach family. And of course, Robert Fortune. Thank you, Thomas Hogg Jr. and the sweet dispositioned Augustine Henry all those Henry I plants. Thank you, Ernest Henry Wilson and your good friend, C.S. Sargent. Thanks to Frank Nicholas Meyer, William Perdom. And finally, thank you, Joseph Rock. From a legacy standpoint, there are so many wonderful plants. Thanks to the plant explorers in my own backyard and they're in your gardens too. I think they'd get a kick out of that. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 